Hey guys, welcome to the first and installment of today's all day event. And hopefully you will enjoy it today, guys. But uh, as it says in the thumbnail, and as it says in the title, and as it says in the description, guys, definitely don't forget to check the description out for today's live all day event. As I will be drawing first Spider Man PS4, as uh, it is coming out very, 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 very soon now. This video is going out to you live on the uh, what day is it today? We're going on Wednesday. And it will be coming out on Friday, well, it, on the 7th, as uh, everybody knows, it's uh, coming out on the 7th. So don't forget to uh, keep tuning in all day. I will obviously be taking breaks throughout the day as um, I've got to get other things ready. But uh, what I'm going to start with today is I'm going to be doing a sketch uh, with pencil and then taking that sketch and uh, sort of inking it with uh, my other favorite inks. If you want to see what other things I have drawn and other wave techniques that I've used for inking and coloring, pencil drawings, uh, pen drawings, and using Copic markers as well, guys. But I don't just uh, use pens and pencils. I also go over to Critter, uh, which is a free app, guys, which I found out through uh, Draw with Jazza, which is the absolutely amazing thing. It's it's amazing, well, the amazing as you can get free, basically. It's completely free. If you want a link to how I got that, where, sorry, where I got that, guys, don't forget to ask for that one down in the description or down in the um, uh, chat, live chat today. And again, if you want to chat to me at all throughout the stream, asking a few things or giving me a few ideas, or where, once I get to the point of actually drawing the suit, uh, which suit you guys want to see, as uh, it's completely, completely um, open for its discussion, because all I'm going to be doing right now is uh, doing a sketch on my paper pen and paper here like i said these are my copic markers but i won't be using them just yet um and normally what i do is i sketch it out in my uh, sketchbook here as uh, you've probably seen already oh there's a comment there oh that's a like <laughs> sorry guys um i've got the screen up on me as well so uh, i can see everything that everybody's seeing uh, but, uh that's that's the first drawing i did I took that one over to Critter first, and then uh, I coloured that in first, and then I decided on the colours afterwards, but I did ink that one. So if you guys want to uh, see the sketch for that one done and the ink, definitely check the other videos. Uh, I don't think the link just yet, because obviously I'm live right now, but they will be as soon as this sketch video finishes. But yeah, guys, if uh, again at any point during today you want to uh, chat to me, just leave a comment down in the comment section. I can see all the comments, and uh, yeah, let's, let's get on with the drawing and using pens pencils and i don't have a pencil here so there it goes the first live event uh, fail sidekick hello pass me my pencils please i'm not your slave no but my sidekick <laughs> bear with me he doesn't have doesn't know which ones i want bear with me Okay, right. That's a, that's a good start. Hey, guys. <laughs> Starting without the pencil. But what I will be using is uh, a mechanical pencil, which I'll show you again shortly. I've got my tripod set up, which I made out of Lego, guys. So if you want to see how I made my tripod, don't forget you can scroll down a few videos. I will go to the creation station where that were, that is uh, put there for you guys to see. Otherwise, bear with me. Like I said, just go and find my pencil. Uh, this, I will show you everything I'm going to use when I uh, change the camera around in a moment, guys. Um, I have picked a picture, which, again, I've got to um, find up in it. Well, I found the picture already, but if you guys want to help me search, um, you want to search with me. But like I said, I've already searched for, for a picture of myself. But, uh, yeah, let's change the camera around, get everything out my way. Because obviously I don't want everything in my way. And uh, let's move some stuff around. I will be listening to Comic Storian again. Oh, that's some glare. Okay, you can't see that. But I will be um, listening to Comic Storian again, guys. I've got heinous amount of wires and I can't do anything about them. That's really good, isn't it? Let's move the computer as well. I wasn't a fair prepared at all, really. <laughs> I 
Okay, so I'm going to be uh, drawing a spiny PS4, but I'm just moving some wires here. That's my hairy arms. Ignore them. Uh, I'm a bit of a monkey. I grew hair, and I never really stopped. <laughs> uh, right, so there's my pencils, but that's not what I'm going to be using to draw on. I will be using this to draw on, guys. Again, I'm just uh, getting everything getting everything getting everything ready. Not if I should use. I can use that as any pencil. I can get rid of pencil. If you hear alarms in the background, guys, I do apologise. I do live near a main road, and the occasional ambulance and things go up and down it. But without further ado, let's get on with this. Um, like I said, I'm going to be sketching. As long as that wire gets out of my way, that's going to irritate me, that is. Whoa. Okay, wire. Get out of my face. But I won't be uh, complete. I won't be talking all the way through this, guys. I will obviously. Um, why is this not high enough? It was before. There we go. It will be on a side slant, just purely because uh, the way the tripod has to be. I don't. My hand is here, and if I was to put it anywhere else, it would be sort of just, just basically. If I was to put it there, oh, it just fell off. Um, if I was to put it there, guys, I wouldn't necessarily be able to draw because I would be sort of there too much close to it but uh, yeah like i said we're going to do spidey today i'm just going to move this piece of paper get myself a little bit more set up but today uh what i'll be using to draw with is my uh, mechanical pencil which gives you a sharper edge and a finer line but uh, to start off with i'm using my what's it called it's my h2 technical pencil really good pencil i have like three or four different shades and that's the lightest shade i've found normally what I use and as always you always need your pencil sharpener if you're going to be using a uh, conventional pencil and uh, unfortunately guys everybody gets it you will need a rubber too because you've got to get rid of those mistakes but as always I don't mind mistakes and any mistakes can be rubbed out through a pencil once uh, we get to the stage of inking I would have finalized and finished what I wanted to draw what I wanted to finish, uh, what I want to finish with, I should say. And again, guys, at any point during the stream, if you want to chat to me, just leave a comment up on the uh, live chat. But I will be listening to uh, Ultimate Spider-Man, like I have done in the previous streams. So if you guys like the Ultimate Spider-Man series, or if there's anything uh, comic-wise, Spidey-wise, obviously, uh, that you guys know about that you think, oh, that'd be cool to listen to as well. Um, but I I've got my favourite uh, guy who is Comic Storian or Comics Explained that I like listen to, listening to when I when I draw because uh, they basically, what they do is they take uh, comics and uh, read them back to you. And as uh, not everybody can afford every single comic that comes out, it's nice to have they, them in the background so I can listen to them while I while I draw. But where are we guys? All uh, right, they've already got a picture, but uh, I'm going to use my phone here, find another one. And as this is an all-day event, uh, again, I'm going to be taking breaks here and there, making cups of tea and whatnot. This is a, the most heinous phone. I've realised it's really bad on screen, but uh, it is my faithful companion when I'm looking for something to draw. Well, while I do so, let's get that comic story in started. So you guys can hear that in the background. If you can hear that in the background, let me know. If you can't, I'll turn it up. But then the news comes on the TV, and the reports announce that there is currently a standoff with Spider-Man and the police. Peter looks at the TV and tells May that he has to run over to Mary Jane's for a second. He rushes back downtown to see the police surrounding a jewelry store, shouting for that fake Spider-Man to come out. Peter swings by and tells them to allow him. He's dying to talk to this guy himself. As Peter jumps onto the building, they all shout for him to get down and put his hands up. He shouts, hey, I'm not the one robbing anything here. Hey. I don't even have pockets in this thing. One of the officers shouts to take him down, and they all begin to open fire on Spider-Man. Most of the bullets fly past, but one hits Peter in the shoulder, and he begins to fall. Yeah, so the just searching something up on my phone. I think I'll use the picture that I have up on the thumbnail. There we go. I'll be using we. I'll be using that picture there. It's a bit shady, but uh, as close to that as I can get. I will obviously be putting a little bit on the background as well. But I probably more than likely will be doing that after drawing the main picture. Yeah, out of town. Um, but yeah, I will be using this picture here on my phone. 
to uh, just flip that around so it's got a bit more. There we go. Um, using this picture here to sort of take the idea and get the shape of Spider Man. As always, you've got to start with a framework, which I'm going to teach you how, guys, to use a framework and uh, how to actually draw a person's frame from arms to legs to head. So that's without further ado, let's listen to the comic story and Ultimate Spider Man series and uh, continue on drawing. I think I should turn this on its side, really. If I'm going to be doing that kind of piece, and uh, we'll have his head here around about here, and his arms and such, and his rest of his body. So a short while later, she takes Peter to the hospital. Without saying anything, Peter stumbles in and collapses onto a doctor. One of the doctors looks at Mary Jane and asks if he's with her. She tells him no, and then he shouts with the others that they need to hurry and get him to the operating room. After surgery, Peter slowly begins to wake back up. And then uh, I wish I start with. with some of the okay, so what? Like I said, guys, we we always always start with a uh, basic frame. We just we don't need an actual huge head. We'll do the shape and such later. And then we'll go to oh what you guys guys is circles and lines is the best way to do a framework. As you would say, like a, make a frame of uh, something out of wire or things like that. It's basically the same idea. We'll get his body here to get the proportions rare, fairly right and close to what you want it to be. There's elbow there and it's probably his hand about there. Like I said, this is all rough at the moment, guys. I'm just getting I just getting the right kind of shape and my phone keeps going out things, so that's gonna irritate me. As the TV comes on, the reporters interview Sergeant Bullet regarding the recent rumor that the main known as Spider-Man has now attempted to rob another Okay, so there we go. Again, we're only doing this rough, so if it looks absolutely horrendous, bear with me. It, the, at the end of the video, or end of today's video, it shouldn't uh, look so rough. Oh, circle for his uh, knee there. Always best to sketch your drawings out first, unless you're a professional artist, obviously. Uh, sketching is the best way and the main way that everybody uh, does draw. The, I don't know any artist that doesn't do a sketch or a uh, outline first. But as she looks at the wound, she says, actually, you're already healing pretty well. Do you have an increased healing factor? And Peter tells her he's not sure, maybe. He hasn't been able to do much research on it. Janet tells that's all right. She has something here that was a chemical in chicken that helps increase the healing of humans. So with a little playing around, she whipped up a little cocktail from his own blood samples. As she injects Peter with the medicine, he asks how do they get a mm, Okay, right. She tells him that Nick got one from him. He should just consider That's a basic idea, basic shape. I'll probably modify this as I'm going. Whether I'm happy with this or not, I don't know. But enjoy listening to Comic Story while I fat. Obviously, I can't talk all the way through this. Hopefully, you can see that okay, but again, it is very, very light in pencil. Spider-Man was robbing an armored truck. They opened fire with their guns at him and they hit his backpack and it began to smoke. Spider-Man took the backpack off and threw it towards a small child. George ran in, grabbing the child, throwing him to safety, but as the bag landed in his lap, it exploded. Okay, right. That night, Peter and Mary Jane went to sit with Gwen on the roof as Peter tells her that it's oh, the phone. only thing that she can say is... It's going irritate me if this phone doesn't stay with the picture I want. Pulse. Peter tries to tell her the video... Keeps tiring out. I wonder if I can turn it off, actually. Give me a second. Acid, but Gwen stops him stating she just wants to be alone for him. The next day, there are things on there, I think. Uh, okay, right. As he crashes through the window, he sees the imposter holding a woman hostage. He's staring right back at him. The fake Spider Man shouts that he'll do it. He'll kill this woman right here, right now. So you better back away. The room fills with silence, and Peter shoots a wet blast, knocking the taser out of the man's hand. As it goes flying, the man tries to jump away, but Peter smacks him down, stating, You just murdered a cop. The man tries to get back up, but Peter grabs him by the back of the neck and he punches him into a teller desk. The man fires a weak web shot, but Peter catches it. He then gets up stating, if it's money you want, you can have it, it's right over there. Peter webs the man's chest and swings him towards him, asking, why me? Why use my costume? 
as he rips the man's mask off, the man says that it was nothing personal. Honest, he's just some guy. Peter throws the man, shouting, some guy? The world thinks Spider-Man is now a murderer, and it's all because of some guy who decided to put on my costume. He grabs the man by the throat, asking, what stops me from murdering you then? The gripper on the man's throat tightens as Peter stares into his eyes, and then he lets go. He looks at himself for what he has just done, but as the police storm inside, they see the man hanging with a note. The man says, please, get me out of here. It was all me. I acted alone. And the officers take the note off as it reads from the real Spider-Man. He heads off and stops back at home, telling himself he almost lost it. He could have killed that man. And then what would he be? But later, as Peter heads home, they find Peter up front and tells him that they need to talk. Inside, Peter and they head into the room where Gwen Stacy is staying, and they tell her due to her situation with her mother, they were hoping that she may consider staying with them. The next day at school, Peter tells Mary Jane that they're going to be finishing up moving the rest of Gwen's stuff in and see what happens. And as he says that, Mary Jane turns away. She says that this is uh, I'm going to be uh, life, making a background of this as well over on Critter and probably this on this piece of paper as well. Uh, I'm going to keep to the size of the uh, spider at the moment, as normally I do it quite large. But as it's a side-on image, I'm going to be doing the background of the... Um, the city as well, as shown, well, as shown as my phone decides to go off screen again, uh, as shown, get up, hurry up, as shown there guys, I'm going to be doing as much to the, uh, this, as close to this as I can, and uh, doing it as close, well, as best as I can on the background as well. Backgrounds aren't my best, but uh, hopefully this should work okie doke, let's stick that there. If she hears his voice, maybe I got a more of an idea. London, but just as Peter gets the courage to dial, he throws the phone aside, stating, No, it's a stupid idea. As the phone flies through the air and crashes into the wall, Peter goes to pick it back up and then notices a door behind a box with a phone lens. Give me a second, guys. There's a door in the background doing my head in. He finds boxes, all of them marked Parker. After going through a few of them, he finds old pictures of himself and his father, among them a videotape. He runs up to his room to play the video and sees that it was from when he was a small child. His family was having a picnic with Aunt May and Uncle Ben and another family. As Peter continues to watch, though, May walks up behind him asking where did he find this. He tells her that he found a bunch of old boxes in the basement. Okay, bye bye. But May stops him, telling him that her and Ben were waiting until he was old enough to see this. It seems that now he's old enough. Peter kind of remembers that other family, the Brocks. He was his father's partner, and May tells him that that's right. He used to play with Eddie Jr., even though he was a bit older. And after the accident of both of their parents, Eddie moved away. May then suggests that maybe he should try and find Eddie. Maybe he can tell him what he found. So Peter does just that, and after a quick internet search, he manages to find Eddie's address and even a phone number. So Peter calls and actually gets a hold of Eddie Jr. The two of them talk for a while, and Eddie says that they should meet up, catch up at all times. And the next day, Peter stops by Eddie's dorm room to head out for some coffee. As they sit, Eddie says that he's actually going to college for astrophysics. Peter tells him that that's actually what his major is going to be as well. Eddie laughs, telling him that it would just be like them trying to impress their fathers. Peter tells him actually that's what he wanted to come Okay, by. he's more of a he's, he's more of a down in a sloped position, so we will put his head a bit further down. And then he says that since we're on this topic, he has something for Peter as well. A little while later, Eddie takes Peter over to a lab that he's been using for school to show him something. As Eddie opens up a small locker, Peter sees a small beaker full of black liquid, and he asks what it is. Eddie grins and tells him that is their inheritance. He goes on to state that this is what their fathers were working on. This is their life's work, or rather, what it would have been if they were given a chance to continue their life's work. Peter asks what's it supposed to be, and Eddie says that currently it's just a pile of protoplasmic goo. But what it's supposed to be... Listening to the Ultimate Spider series. Though he wasn't able to make much sense of it, his while I uh, draw this, I said it's kind of only a sketch stage at the moment. I will he modify this quite a bit as I go along. Person, tailored for their specific DNA. And what it would do is help the body produce its own natural toxins to fight off the cancer. The current work has brought them to phase two, which was supposed to enhance the physical strengths and natural abilities of the patient. But with them running out of their funding, their fathers took up jobs with Trask Industries to try and support it. However, because they were work for hire, it meant that everything that they were working on was technically owned by that company which meant the suit as well. Eddie then hands Peter a journal left by Eddie Sr., stating that he was the one who pushed Ray into working for this company when Ray said that they should Because of it, now they're going through lawsuits to try and finish the project that they spent their lives working on. As Peter flips through the paperwork, Eddie tells him that that's the last part, which was just two before, but under his breath, Peter tells him no. And Eddie says that it all happened just as they were coming back from their meeting with the lawyers. But Peter then asks if that's... The I get a few shapes so I get the right idea where everything should be. Again, use circles and lines, guys. Circles and lines, always the best way to sort of get an idea where you're going, because a, a bulge of a muscle 
is a circle, basically, or is an oval shape. It, it, it's all symmetrical shapes and things like that. So always use those to sort of get to uh, what you want. My faithful friend, the rubber. <laughs> That's why you should never ever do things when you're first sketching out. Never ever put things uh, directly uh, hard lines because you can't rub them out. Well, you can, but you always leave a smudgy, horrible grey behind. As the outer crust hardens, Peter bursts out of it. But what he finds is that the suit has completely covered it. Elsewhere in the city, a pop singer has finished her concert. And she's getting ready to leave when she's suddenly taken off. I am listening to the Ultimate Spidey series. So if you are enjoying that, guys, let me know. And I'll tell you where you can listen to them, too. Or I'll leave a link at some point. Seconds later, Peter opens up the room, jumping into the passenger seat, asking if it's prom season already. Everyone stares at him and he asks, what? And as this is a live event, guys, like I said, you can chat to me at any point. I think that hand's a bit too far away, to be honest. Hand's too big. I'm going to get rid of that altogether and shorten it. Always good to pause for a second or two, look at your work, and think, right, I'm doing okay, but that's not exactly what I want. And finally, after stopping the limo, Peter gets out and lets the singer out and tells everyone that, for the record, they're just an officer pulls up telling Peter to put his hands in the air. And as he does, he fires a weapon and swings away. He tells himself that this suit is amazing. Whatever his dad invented is just amazing. First taking that bullet, and he's also stronger and faster. All he has to do is think, and a web appears. Over at the coin laundry, a man fires a gun, running out, telling people... And he feel frustrated with one part of the drawing. Boys move to another. Dark alley. But as he crawls down towards him, the man begins to fire, and Peter just knocks the gun out of his head, throws him into a pile of boxes. So if you keep on one, one piece and you get frustrated and frustrated all you'll end up doing is making horrible horrible lines horrible mistakes and uh, things you just don't want to do you'll notice this is very close to what i did before but uh, as it's spider-man there's only a few selected poses you can do i may do another spidey over here i'm not sure yet depends how long this one here takes me but uh, I might put a couple in there. It's like a, this is his one spidey pose, and then we've got a spidey pose here, and maybe one over here too. I'm fairly happy with the way the hand is over there. I'm not happy with this here. Elbow seems to be about here. This hand is about here. Match it up. See what I mean, guys? You're Spider-Man. Peter tells him that that doesn't matter right now. What you need to do is just destroy this. He'll explain everything after that is done. A few minutes pass, and then he tells oh, yeah. him that. His oh, there's a second. See if I can get my eyes fixed in. This, this calls him like horrible glasses today. Even with only spilling a drop, it took over. And without his powers, there would have been no way that he could have survived it. There are people out there who would go to extreme lengths to have this. And that's why they have to destroy it. Eddie sighs, telling him it's not like he can stop him anyway. Peter says, look, right now he's the only one who knows about him and his powers. That's how important this is. This stuff is way too dangerous. And he takes a seat and he says that he's amazing. He looks 12, but look at what he's accomplished. The two smile and Eddie gets back up telling him that he just needs to go and digest all of this for a bit. He'll be fine. So after Eddie leaves, Peter makes his way over to the power plant to drop the beaker onto a okay. stack right. to incinerate the liquid. Sure while after yeah, do that. you see what I mean? His hand here, just behind that's his elbow. There's a little bit of blue here, just, just past the main muscle here. I'm going to start putting a bit, bit more high, heavier lines now, just because I'm kind of think I've got where he should be. 
woman asks if someone is in there and reaches out to it. The blob lashes out, grabbing the woman, and then shows its face as it stuffs her into its mouth. The room falls silent, and Eddie pulls himself up, saying to the room, oh, I'm hungry, but I can't feel anything. I can't even feel my legs. This is all Peter's fault. I need to kill him. I need to kill Spider-Man. The suit begins to wrap itself around Eddie's body, and he shouts, I can do this. I can hold it together. But why? Can't I feel my heart's beating? After a bit of struggling, Eddie stands back up, now with the suit completely covering him, and he tells himself, Okay. The suit tries to take back over, but the two guards appear asking, What's going on? But when they look in, they see a creature standing before them, screaming. One of the guards radios to call the cops, but Eddie grabs the two of them and devours them. The next day at school, Peter sits in class as the rain begins to beat down on the window, when he suddenly feels his fighting sense going on. He looks around, and when he looks outside, he sees lightning striking, and then the image of the suit outside screaming. He asks how. The suit shouldn't be there. He destroyed it. But now it's here, and he needs to end this. He leaves class, heading outside into the rain to face off against the suit that caused him so many problems earlier. But then it tells him that he shouldn't have lied. Peter watches as he sees a face try to push itself out, and then he asks, Is that? And Eddie pulls himself out, shouting, Our father's tried to create this! Now you will, too. Peter tells him, please tell me you didn't do this to yourself on purpose. But without answering, Eddie throws a barbed tendril into attack. Peter grabs it, shouting, this isn't you! This is just the suit! Let me help you! And Eddie shouts, you'll die! But he lunges forward. The tendrils wrap around Peter's neck and they slam him into the ground. Peter screams. And we're, when we get to, uh, telling Eddie, you can fight this, you have to. Legs and things Eddie still circles and lines. As you've seen, I've already done the framework, but as I've drawn uh, Spidey before, and many times on uh, my channel. Eddie quickly overpowers Peter and pushes them off of the building. But as they fall, they break through the power lines, shocking the both of them. They fall onto a passing car, causing the car to crash into the side of a building. Peter gets back up, seeing Eddie knocked out. And as he gets closer, his spidey sense begins to go off and the suit grabs him. As it begins to pull him into the blob, Eddie asks, How does it feel? How does it feel to be a thief and a liar? But to survive, the suit needs you. It needs to absorb you. Everything begins to fade to black and Peter jumps out of the box, shouting, No! But Eddie screams, we need you! Before Eddie can get back up and attack, Peter runs back in with a tire, cracking and shattering Eddie's face. As Eddie's body flies over the power lines, the sound of sirens can be heard, and then officers begin to shout for them to stop what they're doing. Peter tells Eddie that he needs to listen, but as the officer sees Eddie in the suit, they open fire on him. Eddie screams out of pain as the officers unload into him, but as he stumbles back, he steps on a live electrical wire. The electricity shoots through Eddie's body, and in a blinding flash, turned into a burning puddle. The officers all call out to Peter, but he climbs up the building and escapes. Elsewhere in the city, Nick Fury sits to enjoy his evening dinner when he sees a notification on his watch. He pays the waiter, and he walks over to a nearby alley, and as he stands there, he flashes a light. And across from him, someone falls into the dumpster. Nick asks Peter why he's following him, and Peter pulls himself out and asks, What the hell is that? Nick tells him that it's something that temporarily paralyzes a person. So how long has he been following him? Peter tells me he's not sure since he left their headquarters. Nick laughs, telling him he just followed the leader of the top espionage organization on the entire planet for over an hour. Not bad. So that leads them back to the first question. What do you want? Peter shouts that he doesn't want his powers anymore. Take them. Do whatever they need to do to get rid of them. He just wants his life back. Nick looks at him and plainly tells him, no. Now we'll explain what happened. Through his staggered breathing, Peter tries to explain what happened to Eddie and how he tried to stop him, but Nick then asks, where is he now, or was he killed? Peter says he doesn't know if he was, and Nick asks, you're not sure if you killed someone? Peter tells him he thinks he did kill him, but the body disappeared. Nick then says that there's not many actual rules in this game, but one big one is that if there's no corpse, then the guy's alive. Peter stops him shouting, look, I don't want this. Do the right thing and end this. But Nick places his hand on Peter's shoulder, telling him, You've had a rough day. The important thing to ask yourself is if doing what you did today made someone's life better. The answer is yes. Stop whining. Once you're older, you're going to be a part of one of the finest organizations in the world. You'll be working alongside Tony Stark, Bruce Banner, and Captain America. While Nick goes on, Peter hardly listens and asks, What about my parents? How do they die? It was 10 years ago. Nick tells him, No idea. 10 years ago, he was in college in India. He then tells him, Look, my parents died when I was young too, and it sucks. Just go home and watch one of those videos with the girls doing that booty shaking thing. As he leaves, Nick shakes Peter's hand and tells him, next time he wants to talk, make an appointment, or he'll shoot him. Afterwards, Peter decides that he should probably follow back up in the lab to see if he can find some information on Eddie. But what he finds is Eddie's professor, Kirk Connors, drunk at his desk. He tells Peter that it didn't take much to suspect that he was Spider-Man after seeing him on TV wearing the suit. So 
So good uh, for that. Leg is too small. They had met before, haven't they? Back when he saved his life, when he turned into that thing. Did he happen to tell anyone about it? Peter tells him no, but what exactly happened here? Kirk voices on another brain saying how all of everything is gone. The suit, the files, the samples, everything. For a moment, he thought Spider-Man had taken it, but it seems that him and Eddie need to have I'm listening to um, comics while I do this, guys. Gives me more, sure more inspiration and things. Listening to the Ultimate Spider-Man series at the moment, as uh, that's the only one I found the comic story and I've done a full series of. As it's an all-day event, I'm trying to um, get as much done in one go. Everyone, including him, purposely turned themselves into monsters. But Kurt rushes off the comment, telling him, Yeah, well, Einstein wasn't trying to invent the atomic bomb. It just worked out that way. As Kurt talks, his speech begins to slur, and he begins to pass up in the drinks. Frustrated, Peter jumps out the window, calling out to Eddie. But even with his spider sense going off, Peter finds nothing. He's left, all alone. As class begins for Peter, he sits in his chair, wondering, Just how is it he's going to get a new costume? With his run-in with Eddie, he's now left costumeless. But since he got his original costume from wrestling... Maybe he can go get another. All of these thoughts begin to pass through his head as Mary Jane stares at him, and she scribbles in her notebook. What's the matter? She nudges Peter. After reading it, Peter scowls, writing back, What do you care? The two go back and forth until finally Peter writes, If you really cared, why are we not together? But before Mary Jane can respond, the teacher grabs her and Peter's notebooks and starts to read the conversation to the class. Everyone begins to laugh at them, and Gwen whispers to Peter, Oh, dude. Once class is over, Peter heads out, but before he can leave, Flash stops him, asking if he has a minute. Peter looks around and doesn't see anyone in the hallways and asks for what? Is he just going to try to pull some pranks so that everyone can laugh at him? Flash tells him no, he uh, needs to talk to him outside for a second. Peter thinks about it for a moment and then says, you know what? No. Everyone's probably outside waiting to see what happens. So, no. And he walks off. Kong steps out of class and sees Flash and asks what's going on. And Flash quietly tells him nothing. Later that day, a group of thugs begin to chase down a woman that they're trying to rob. The woman mistakenly turns down a dead-end alley and the thugs start to surround her. As one pulls out a knife, his hand gets webbed up and Peter calls out from the shadows that they must be real happy being walking cliches. Not even a care in the world! Peter jumps out wearing a sweater and jeans and the thugs just stare at him. With no one moving, Peter asks, what? And the leader of the group asks, who are you supposed to be, Spider-Man? Where's the costume? Peter tells him that his mom is washing it for him, and the leader lunges forward. Everyone follows behind him, so Peter grabs and knocks the group out while throwing them all into a corner. After wiping the group up, Peter goes back to check on the woman, and she just points at his eye. He notices that one of his lenses fell out of his mask, and he tells everyone not to move. It's a white sliver of glass. A short while later, after trying to fix his makeshift costume, Gwen comes downstairs asking Peter if he wants to go to a party. He tells her that they're both losers, everyone hates him, and she hates everyone, so what's the point? Gwen says they should at least try it and see if anybody else there is having fun at all. Under his breath, Peter says it's only because of miserable loner orphans. But Gwen stops and telling him, screw it, we're going to the party. So as they go to the house party, it's just as Peter said, neither of them are having fun. And just as Peter gets ready to leave, he sees Liz and Mary Jane, but different. She has a haircut and it's dyed black and she's wearing skimpy little clothes. Mary Jane isn't the same girl as before. So as she walks through, she sees Peter out of the corner of her eye, but she doesn't stop. He sighs, telling himself that it's time to go now, and Gwen tells him, absolutely. But no sooner does Gwen say that than a loud boom comes from outside. All of the teenagers run out of the house chanting, Janelle! When Peter and Gwen get outside, they see a young boy standing on a smoking car, and then he begins to hold his hand. Hmm. Light begins to shine from his palm, and then suddenly another car explodes, and all of the kids begin mm-hmm. chanting Janelle's name. But as the teenagers call out for him to do it again, sirens begin to blare down the street. The teenagers start to scatter, and Peter and Gwen run out the back, and that's when they spot Mary Jane and Liz. Peter helps Mary Jane for being knocked over, and the four start running through the crowd. A little while later, though, everyone meets up at the bus stop, and Gwen asks what exactly happened back there. Two other girls say the kid's name is Janelle or something, but he goes to their school. While the girls gossip about him, Gwen spots the public bus coming their way and tells everyone to come on. As everyone gets on the bus, Peter and Mary Jane catch each other looking at one another. Mary Jane smirks, patting the seat next to her, and Peter asks, what's so funny? She leans in, whispering that it's funny that he could be home in like two seconds if he wanted, but instead he's riding the bus like the rest of them. He says, about that, he may have lost his costume. But as they go on and laugh, Mary Jane reaches into her purse and pulls out a letter. When everyone gets off of their stops, Mary Jane pulls Peter aside and tells him that she's going to give him this letter that she's been holding for a while. She just wants him to read it when he gets home. Not before. Peter tells her fine, and she nervously hands the letter over and leaves with Liz. Afterwards, Peter rushes home to read the letter, and it's a letter telling Peter how much she loves him, and that she's just so scared about everything that happened around him. But she wants to find ways to communicate herself better so that they can actually... I'm fairly happy with that. So she'll be waiting for him to come over. 
As soon as he finishes reading, he runs out of the basement and down the street to Mary Jane's house. He climbs into the window and he asks Mary Jane if she means it. She says yes. She's just so scared. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, yeah. Is going to throw her off a high building. Peter tells her that yeah, he had a few details in. The next day at school, Peter sees some of the kids spray painting Jadolf rules across the lockers, and he asks himself, "How exactly does he rule anyway?" As he goes on thinking, Mary Jane kisses Peter on the cheek and asks if everything's all right now. He tells her, of course. But while they talk, Flash asks Peter if he has a second to talk. Peter snaps at him, telling him that he really doesn't have anything to say to him. And Mary Jane adds, shouting, you just grow up. Flash tries to continue He's put the other spider in now. It's nothing. And as he so walks away, he one for that. shouting, what's going on? She holds out her phone and says that it's her cousin who invited them to that party. And it sounds like that guy, Jadolf, is blowing up more things again. Mary Jane leans into Peter, telling him, you gotta go. But don't worry. I have at least half a costume done for you. Peter asks, what does she mean by half? And Mary Jane says that she needs it. Okay, right, well, I've done this uh, basic sketch for this one. I'm going to find another picture now for this side here. Ambitious, I know, but it's an all-day event. So, uh, give me... Come on, Faye, just do as I ask. There we go. That's never for you, isn't it? Peter Wedger is um, telling him I'm Spider Man and I'm about to stop you from doing something really dumb. Jadolf looks at his hands and he begins to electrify them, burning the webbing away, telling him, You look better on TV. The cops begin to arrive and Peter tells him, You know, totally not sticking around to have one of those trademark misunderstandings of the police. So it's time for us to get out of here. Before swinging away, Jadal grabs Peter, asking him to take him too. They can't arrest him, they'll be sent back home. Peter tells him that's nice and he shoots a web and starts to lift off. But before he can get very far, Jadal grabs him by the shirt, throwing Peter off balance. The two flee the basic pose that we've got there. Rip, and he begins to fall. Peter begins to shout, you're such an idiot. And he waves on grabbing him and flinging him onto oh, a nearby building. As they lay and tumble onto the roof, Peter there asks, what the hell were you thinking? People already blamed me for a bunch of stuff. I don't really need this too. Janelle starts to get up telling Peter that he was just trying to teach the principal something about suspending half the football team for going to a party. And something Peter like that. Him, um, what party? Janelle explains that there was a party the other night. When the Very bad. What happened, I've got a lot of light coming in from the other room, uh, from the other area. Let's see if I can get rid of some of that, maybe. Peter scratches his head, trying to think of a better word than idiot. Like he just fight Doc Ock or something. He then asks, what kind of powers does he have? That's a bit better, eh? Because it's a big focus and point. He then points at a barrel and it explodes. Peter asks, so you're a mute? Janelle shouts that he's not a mutant. You hear me? I'm not a mutant. They are the devil's children. Peter steps back trying to logically think about how such a power is even possible. And then he tells Janelle to look. He may want to consider how he's using his powers or maybe be more responsible with them. Janelle asks, why would he do that? And Peter shouts, what do you mean? Help people. Do something good with those powers. But before the two of them can go on, they hear gunshots and screams coming from down below. They see a store being robbed, and Peter tells Jadolf to just hold on. And as he gets ready to jump off, Jadolf says that he wants to come too. He can help! And Peter tells him no. You will be right here, so just watch. He walks into the store as the robbers are demanding money, and he tells them that they should probably just drop the money and lose the stupid mask. The man in the Captain America mask turns back, shouting that he's one to talk, and he fires his gunshots. The bullet shoots through, hitting the window, and one of the robbers says, man, he sucks. Peter webs the shooters down yeah, he really His arm is pretty small, right but uh, after punching out the shooter, the other robbers say that they would like to not be punched. So yeah, pretty small, guns. actually. <clears throat> right. I've got this other one I want to draw as well, guys. If I decide it's going to keep changing the image that I'm looking at, Stop there. Janelle asks, "You like?" Peter answers by smacking him across the face, asking him what's wrong with him. He could have killed people down there. Janelle then gets back up telling Peter that he better step up. But while the two begin to argue again, a female voice asks them if they wouldn't mind. They would like to talk to them. The two turn back to see Jean Grey telling them... Okay, so we've got his arm here. The X-Men. Fairly long one. The cute ones. The storm continues. I see it on TV. Peter whispers to Janelle... We're going to do two classic poses today. As the girls continue to introduce themselves, Jean says that she's sorry if they freaked them out or anything like that, but they just needed to talk, and Peter asks why. So Jean goes on explaining that they and the other X-Men are mutant peacekeepers, and their focus is to bring peace between man and mutant, which is why they wanted to speak to Janelle. Janelle stares at her, trying to form words, but through his stuttering, he ends up fading. Kitty leans down, asking if he really just fainted after being told that he was a mutant, and Peter says that he's pretty in denial of that fact. While Storm and Kitty tend to Janelle, Jean psychically tells Peter that he did a good job trying to talk to him. Peter shouts, what the hell was that? And Jean continues telling him that they're speaking telepathically. Just think that she can read it. Peter tells Jean that he's not sure he's very comfortable with her in his head. And she says, try not to be uncomfortable. It's really not a big deal. In fact, he's the first guy who hasn't mentally pictured her naked in six months. Peter remains quiet, and Jean says, until now. 
Still being quiet, Peter tells her sorry, and Gene asks if he's done yet. The two go back and forth looking at each other, and Peter says, okay. Go. Come on, Faye, I want to see. I'm doing another picture now, guys. So I'm going to be doing two pictures, one here and one on the side, one he's uh, sticking up against the wall, and one where he's obviously swinging through. Or more of a jumping through, I think. They're in rough stage at the moment, so definitely, guys, keep tuned, as this is an all-day event. And I will be going from sketch to final sketch to design, then to ink, and then taking over to Critter, guys. This is the first installment of uh, my sketches. Peter then asks, how does she know? Maybe he's pretending to hang up and staying on the line. As the girls bring Jadolf onto their aircraft, they ask Peter if he'd like to come, and he tells them, you know what? Sure. The jet soars into the sky, and Peter asks Jean if she actually knows how to fly. Which is fine. Which actually stay here so I can see the goddamn image. She's making a funny, and she tells him yes. But while everyone talks, Jadolf smaller because... I would have it on the screen, guys, but I'm saying if you guys would like to leave a comment at any time, you can do. Why not leave some input? Why well, not tell me what you could do? Why not tell me if I'm doing things wrong? Everyone starts to get sucked out of it. A little while later, Peter begins to wake up and find himself in a bed. He looks around to see Charles and he introduces Peter to his X Men. And he quietly says, Uncanny. Peter shouts, Wait, what? Storm quickly explains what happened. It was that she helped Kitty guide the plane before crashing. Jean then flew out, grabbing Jadolf and saving him just at the last second before he splattered on the ground. Peter blankly stares and Storm shouts, And you're welcome. As Peter processes everything, he realizes that he's not wearing his mask. Why did they take his mask off? He was trying to keep his identity secret, and no one seems to be respecting that. Now everyone knows that he's just plain old Peter Parker. Kitty smiles and says, actually, we didn't know your name until now. After getting dressed and putting back on his mask, Peter heads over to the medical room to see Jadol to make sure that he's okay. When he does, Jadol tells Peter that he should totally check out what they did to his nipple. Peter says that he looks uh, a lot happier than last time, and Charles says that he gave him a happy thought. Peter asks Charles if that's even ethical. Charles tells him honestly no, but he did just lose an aircraft because of this kit. Charles then goes on to tell him that the reason that they wanted to speak with him is because that through Cerebro they could track humans. But with Jadolf, they couldn't, which has never happened before. In fact, it didn't even register her as human, which leads one to Okay, right, that's a uh, second, second pose. So with that being the case, the way I want it. find out who did this and more importantly why. Peter then says, all right, so what are you going to do with it? Charles tells them that they'll present him to a... We'll sharpen all of this up later, guys, so keep tuned for that. ...to the UN so that they can basically finally stop the countries that are turning a blind eye to inhumane mutilations. This is really a smoking gun. And Peter corrects him. He. Charles asks what. And Peter points at Jadolf, saying, he. We're talking about a human. Peter then goes on to ask if Jadolf doesn't want to be a part of their agenda. He's already a mutant phobic. Charles tells him that at this point, it's not up to him. There are much bigger considerations. Peter says that he's going to try and say that this guy deserves a shot at normal life. So I've an idea where the head should be. Define normal. So after thinking about it, Peter turns around shouting, Define this! And he punches Beast! Peter then grabs Jadol, kicks the Cyclops in the head, and he runs out of the lab! Colossus tries to stop him, but Peter just tackles through him and out the window. As he lands, Peter sees Charles standing there asking, What good would that do? Peter then steps back to reality, back in the lab, saying, What? Well, that would... I just thought... Charles then tells Peter that he's sure that he just read about his work. He knows what him and the X-Men stand for, so... He well, I'm not happy with that at all. <laughs> okay with all of this and he tells her that he guesses she then asks if he needs to ride back to queens and peter shouts oh god what time is it a short while later peter walks across his lawn into his basement thinking about how he really needs to stop meeting people that he looks up to they're all starting to seem kind of crazy actually he probably shouldn't be thinking that what if charles and Xavier's listening before he can wonder any further they stop so telling him they really need to talk it's late into the night in new york and a woman with long silver hair stands atop a building waiting Across the way, she watches a man and a woman. Okay, her right. Finally turn out the lights and leave. With a smile I'm on not happy face, with this one. fires a grappling hook over to the building and begins to slide down the I wasn't happy with that one. As she gets closer, the woman sneaks into the building when a guard walks out of patrol. Once inside, she then leans over to the locked office where she saw the man and the woman earlier. She pulls out a small device to put into the door lock to override the lock, and after a few seconds, the door unlocks and swings open. Once inside, the woman makes her way to the back where the painting hangs, but before touching it, she uses a spray to create a layer of smoke. The cloud hovers in front of the picture, revealing a laser security line covering the entire wall. She then pulls out a small set of mirrors, and after positioning them, creates an opening for the painting. She pulls the painting off the wall and finds a metal safe with no handle and no way to open it from the outside. After searching the desk contents, she finds an out-of-place folder and pulls on it. The folder lifts and it pulls a string and there's a sudden click. 
When she looks back to the safe door, it pops open, and she reaches in to pull out a wrapped object. After pulling back the cloth, she finds an old stone tablet and smiles. She then sneaks back outside, but before she can leave, Peter Parker asks, Um, what exactly are you doing? The woman turns back, and as Peter sees her figure, he tells her, Wow, you're, um, you're not like the usual riffraff I find sneaking around the rooftops. But without saying a word, the woman jumps off the ledge of the roof and Peter quickly follows. However, as he leaps, he notices the woman grab onto the wall and then hops back up onto the roof. As he falls, he tries to fire his web shooters and nothing comes out. Back on the roof, the woman starts to run as Peter jumps back up, telling her that she would not believe what almost happened. There he was, midair, almost about to die, and then he remembered he had spider powers and he saved himself. The woman continues to run and Peter jumps airway, telling her to hang on. He's not done with his verbal anxiety attack yet. She jumps over him, and Peter jumps again in her way, and with no other choice, she begins to kick and fight off Peter. As the two of them struggle, the woman flips Peter onto his back, telling him that he just crossed the black cat. That's seven years of bad luck. She continues to run on, stepping on Peter's head, and as Peter gets on the chaser, he trips and falls. Phone's freaking out, I can't get the right picture. A short while later, Peter heads back to the it's Mary one thing to not show in pictures I actually picked. Thank you, Phone. I'm using this piece of junk, by the way. Peter asks what's going on, and May says that Mary Jane's father is here. The two run into the kitchen, and Mary Jane sees her father, Craig, pulling her diary. She shouts that she can't believe that he would go through her things, and she runs up crying. Craig says that he found an interesting story. He begins to read off, I almost died tonight. If Peter hadn't been at the bridge, I don't know what I would have done. What if no one found my body? Craig well, I hate that picture. Asking, what did Mary Jane mean by that? The head. Peter stands there not answering, and Craig shouts, that's fine. He came here to tell him that he will never see Mary Jane again. They are the worst. While Craig continues to yell, May steps in, stopping him, telling him that it's time for him to leave. He storms out as May turns back to Peter, asking what was that all about. He says that it was nothing, they were just at the park, and Mary Jane slipped and he caught her. That's all. May then asks, why not just tell him that? And Peter shouts, because he's a jerk. He heads up to his room and he notices the news, and they seem to be talking about Spider-Man. The screen cuts away to images of him running after the woman earlier, and the reporter stating that they have pictures of Spider-Man escaping the scene of a crime with a burglar known as Black Cat. Peter watches and begins to think that this seven years of bad luck seems to be starting right about now. Meanwhile, over at the Fisk Corporation building, William Fisk's lawyer, Walter Diddy, stands with the man who had just robbed, asking where is the tablet. The man says that apparently from the news, Spider-Man has it. And Walter asks, what is he going to do with it? The man says that he's not sure, but he has a slight feeling that Kingpin took it. Him and his criminal organization were the only ones who even knew about the tablet. Walter tells him that that will be pointless. He was we're going to get this. We're going to have to get this rush. Walter pulls out a business card telling yeah, him speed up a little bit of thing, guys. No one will answer but leave a message, and someone will call him back with a place, time, and how much money to bring. When they meet, don't talk about anything other than the task of getting back their item. The man says that he's not so sure about this, but Walter stops him telling him that he made a promise to Mr. Fisk. It's best that he does not back out on their deal. The next day at school, Peter sees Mary Jane in the halls and tells her that there was something about him last night. And something involving a cat. Okay, I'm going to come off of that one now. Go back to original one. I was already looking at a private school this morning if they continue to talk. Peter says that her father's bluffing. She can't possibly think that he would do something like that. And he goes on to tell her that he can't believe that she is letting him get between them after everything that they've been through. She shouts, What does he want her to do? And Peter shouts, asking, What does she want him to do? But rather than say anything, Mary Jane turns to cover her face and leaves. Later at work, Robertson tells Peter that he needs him to enter some personal ads into the database to be posted. So Peter starts opening up letters. Uh, and I've lost all my images. That was easy. Thanks, phone. Best phone in the world. And as Peter goes through opening the letters, he finds one with a rather large sum of money in it. Robertson tells him to let's see that for a second. And he begins to read up the letter. Spider, spider. I was in the just did a head now. For you. We should explore this. Meet me over on the roof from last time with the cat. He hands back the letter, stating that he doesn't know what that's supposed to mean, but just put it in with the rest anyways. As the night begins to fall, Peter knows what this letter meant. It was meant for Spider-Man, a.k.a. him. So he sneaks out to meet with the woman where they met last night. Once he gets there, he sees Black Cat sitting on the roof with two glasses of wine. And he tells I have her lost that the image. This is oh, go away, Brian. You can run out of battery now. Great. She called him out so that they could talk. He seemed rather interesting. He says that she robbed that man last night and then beat the snot out of him. And she tells him that that guy wasn't a nice guy. Beating him up was just kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Black just finding it, uh, no, the image again, guys. There we go. Yeah, so flip it. That finding the image, so I've... Uh, get a tone and things like that. Because it looks in, it's looking horrendous. But it won't once I've finished. Electric jumps out, throwing shurikens at them. 
The two scramble to dodge the attack, but one of them flies by cutting through Peter's costume. He shouts, come on, not another costume, and then he stumbles backwards, hitting his head. Black Cat jumps up, blocking Electro's attack, and the two begin to exchange blows. Peter watches the girls fight and asks himself what he's supposed to do. Black Cat is a burglar, and the other one, well, who knows what she's doing here? As Electro rips part of Black Cat's costume away, she shouts that she should give back what she stole. Black Cat manages to smack the other side out of Electro's hands, and she shouts that she's not her father. Tell her master that she is not him. Electra tells her that she really shouldn't have done that and kicks upwards, pushing Black Cat away, and then she kicks her in the stomach. Black Cat's body goes flying into Peter, but then she gets right back up and charges into the fight when she suddenly pulls back. She looks back as he's You can't leave a comment and chat to me, guys. And if I'm just taking a quick breather, when I look at the picture, get, get myself ready to start putting uh, muscle tone and other things on there now. She continues attacking with her sigh, and Peter snatches it from her hand, telling her to come on! However, even without the sigh, Electra keeps swinging, and as Peter jumps away, she kicks him in the leg, sending him to the ground. He grabs his knee, asking what's wrong with her, and Electra grabs him by the arm and flips him over and kicks him off the side of the roof. Peter's body begins to fall down into the streets, and he fires a web and slingshots himself back upwards. But as he climbs, he misfires the web, and he slams into the side of the building. After falling into an awning, he looks up, stating that at least he is not dead, so that's something. He quickly rushes back up the building, and when he gets there, he looks all over the roof and sees that both Black Cat and Electra are gone. He lays down and says, this is nice, and what did Black Cat say? She's not her father? Suddenly, the door swings open, and a guard steps out, shouting, oh my god! Peter tells him to be quiet. The phone begins to ring. Just waking up, May grabs it, mumbling, hello? And the woman's voice asks if it's Nick. So May asks, who is it? The panicked woman says that her name is Mary Watson, Mary Jane's mother, Mary Jane. She's, she's gone. She packed a bag and she ran away. It's right, okay. <clears throat> Let's get my other pencil. Again, I'm using two, 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 two different pencils. Gwen says that she doesn't know, but suddenly majors a thump in the kitchen. She hurries downstairs, flipping on the light switch, shouting, Peter! Peter spits up some milk that he was just drinking, stating that she scared the crap out of him. And May then asks, what is he doing? Why is he not in bed? Where's Mary Jane? Peter says that he was just up studying for his midterm. What happened to Mary Jane? May says that Mary Jane's mother called them in a frenzy. She took a bag and now she's gone. Peter runs outside and down the street to Mary Jane's house. I'm going to get this so I can have it side by side on the uh, screen. Peter tries to state that he's here to check on that, but Craig grabs Peter by the shirt, demanding to know where his daughter is. Peter grabs Craig's arm, telling him don't. She ran away because he was making her miserable. Not because of, but Mary breaks them both apart and asks Peter to just please go find her. Peter begins to think back to when Nick Fury told him that he shouldn't tell people who he is, because clearly Mary Jane cannot handle it. He tries to think where Mary Jane could have gone, and then it clicks. He rushes over to the old warehouse where he... The phone's no, it's not doing me any good. It keeps turning off because I can't focus on what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do now, guys, I'm just quickly looking on the computer to get the same image so I can have it a bit larger. And so I can see things a lot better if I do that. She couldn't breathe. She just had to get out of there. The entire night, her father just said that threatening to ship her away and not let her see him. Peter hugs her, telling her that she needs to go home. Mary Jane asks if they can just run away and get married. Peter holds her face, telling her not yet. She tells him that she's going to be grounded forever now. So he hugs her again, telling her that's fine. He's not going anywhere. The next morning at work, Peter dozes at his desk, thinking about what Black Cat said about not being her father, and then an image of Kingpin flashes by. He snaps back awake, and he begins to search the company laws for cat burglars. And one name hits, Jack Hardy. Peter reads the article about Black Cat Jack being... I've lost that image. Peter That's always good. Right, I have to search through the, all of these now. Great. Search, Peter sees the girl's name is Felicia Hardy, and her current employer is Fisk Enterprises. Over at Felicia's apartment, Wilson grabs Felicia by the neck, slamming her into a wall, telling her that she wanted his attention... She's got it now. As this is live. I'm doing it all live, so it does take me a minute or two in between bits. As I said, it's just a rough at the moment shape sort of idea where it's going to be, what shape it's going to be. There we go. There's the one I want. Body begins to fall down, so Peter struggles with Electra as she tries to cut it. He shouts, Not the costume! Seriously, I really don't have a spare this time. And then he webs up Electra's face. Wilson starts to pick himself back up, but he shouts, and Peter, that he doesn't know why he's involved. Good in enough. He's um, not interfering with his life. This is too important for you two. But Wilson's words are stopped mm -hmm. as Peter webs his face up, telling him to put an extra large sock in it. Peter then jumps at the window, climbing to the rooftop, shouting to Felicia that she needs to stop this. They're actually going to kill her, or even worse, they're going to kill him. 
Felicia looks over the ledge and says that he was the one who killed her father. Wilson betrayed him and left him in prison, and that is why she needs to destroy him. Everything that he says he wants, she will take away from him. This stone tablet is just the first. Peter looks at the tablet and stated that he doesn't even know what that is, and it's very noble of her wanting to stick at the fist, but she is stealing. Felicia shouts that he doesn't know her, but before she can go on, Wilson bursts through the rooftop doorway, screaming for her to give it back now. She smiles and throws the tablet off the roof down into the waters below. She laughs, stating that now she's another rock at the bottom of the river, and she's very glad that he got to see her do it. Then a side is thrown, hitting Felicia right in the chest. Electra turns her attack towards Peter, and he jumps up the roof to try and catch Felicia, and she's already gone. Peter hops out of the roof, shouting to stop where, but Wilson, Fisk, and Electra are gone. Later the night, Wilson sits in a hospital bed, saying how he's going to spend every dollar they had for them. He wanted to find the ancient text so that they could find a way to open her eyes again. And on the bed lays Wilson's wife, unresponsive. He goes on saying that no matter what, he will punish those who try to stop him. But please, wake up. While everything for Peter seems to have remained calm, S.H.I.E.L.D. is in no time in gathering up the villains who have taken part in the unauthorized genetic mutations. In their custody is now Otto Octavius, also known as Doc Ock, Max Dillon, also known as Electro, okay, Flint Marco, right. known as the Sandman, and Norman Osborn, known as the Green Goblin. Since their capture, Hank Pym has been working on these four in an attempt to rehabilitate them, allowing them to try and do some good for once. Outside, though, Agent Sharon Carter escorts Craven the Hunter to containment, explaining to him that the device around his neck will stabilize genetics if he tries to do anything. Not smart. Craven shouts, asking if they know who he is. He is Craven. His face begins to change, and he yells as his teeth start to form fangs, and Sharon tells the guards to hit the collar. Suddenly, the collar around Craven's neck starts to go. Craven, I don't like Craven the Hunter. Such a stupid hair. Sharon hit. goes on Villain. telling him, like she was saying, the collar will forcibly stabilize his genetic structure, and as you can see, it's not a pleasant experience. One thing you should know, though, is that the color does match his strength, so the harder that he resists it, it is possible that it will fry his brain. Back in the holding cells, the guards toss Craven in, and Max says that he knows that guy. Is he really a mutant? Sharon tells him no. They keep the mutant terrorists on a whole other slice of heaven. This is the place for those cute little genetic anomalies. So sleep tight. As Sharon leaves, Craven slowly starts to wake back up, and Max calls out that, by the way, his show is really sucky. Craven screams and runs towards the barrier and he's electrocuted, and Max just sits in his cell laughing. Down the hall, Norman sits in his cell asking, why would they bring all six of them together? Otto asks him, what does he mean by six? There's only five of them here. And Norman leans back, telling him, no, there will be six. The next day, the captives are all brought out, and Hank tries to speak with them all again, mainly Norman, since he's been the most silent out of all of them. Hank asks, what is it that made him do all of this? He had everything that he could ever want. A wife, a child, millions of dollars, his own business, legendary scientific acumen. And Norman laughs, telling him, I was just doing what Nick Fury tells me to do. They wanted the Oz formula, the miracle that made me and Otto the way that we are. Hank says, actually, we already have the formula. That and everything that you own was seized the day that you were taken into custody. As Hank goes on, Norman gets angry, and his skin starts to change, and Norman changes into the Green Goblin, breaking out of his restraints. But seconds later, Hank's giant hand grabs him and slams him down to the ground. Hank looks back at the other captives and tells them that at least they know... Oh, the I'm getting more and more disappointed by this. Norman back to his cell after being released from medical and asks everyone to guess who's back and better than ever. And by better, she means completely sedated out of his mind. Max shouts that he doesn't feel very comfortable having Norman around them. And Sharon tells him to be quiet or she'll stick them both in the same cell. Max tells her, fine, at least take her top off for them. Sharon smiles, telling him sure, and she starts to unbutton her shirt as Max's eyes light up. Sharon stops telling him, psych, and Max grits his teeth, telling her that she will be the first. Otto looks over at Norman's cell, and as the two lock eyes, Otto calls out that he would like to talk to Hank, please. He wants to talk. A short while later, Otto stands before Hank and his team, telling him that he just wants to help after seeing... Right, let's get rid of some of these himself. irritating he lines. He's a man of science not some monster, so please let him help. Hank stares at him for a moment and says that he'll get back to him on that. And a few days later, Hank walks Otto into their research facility and Otto asks what is the overall focus that they are trying to achieve here. Hank tells them that he may know. The next war will most likely be fought genetically, so they're working on ways to stay ahead of that. Otto looks around and says that it's really good to be back in the lab. And another researcher says that she knows that this might be a bit too soon, but they have a surprise for him. Otto sees the table with his mechanical arms. And the researcher says that those arms have revolutionized high-risk lab working. But as Otto stares at him, 
He says that it's strange being a man of science, but he wonders if his connection to them is more of a mental connection. Like a connection, not just physical. Maybe the explosion that grafted it to him was in fact a method of mentally unlocking his control over them. Otto continues to talk, but soon no one responds. He then looks around, telling them that they'll just have to take his word for it. But the arms are already out, just stabbing everyone in the chest. Back over in the holding cells, the lights go out, and everyone starts to walk out of their cells, wondering what's going on. Flint Marco asks if this means that they can use their powers, and Max sparks his finger, telling him, there's only one way to find out. He starts to emit electricity, and he fires a blast, hitting Norman's collar. Norman falls to his knees, groaning. And a moment later, he starts to change into a green goblin. Once everyone's collars are disabled, Otto knocks down the door, and Norman asks him if he's the one who did this. Otto tells him that it's called, telling them what they want to hear. And what he's become is truly magnificent. Norman tells him that they are now even. So it's time for him to get his boy destroyed, Nick Fury. And Otto asks, where do they keep your son, Harry? Norman asks him, what is he talking about? His boy's name is Peter. At once, the Ultimates hear their communicators going off, and everyone rushes over to the now-destroyed containment facility. Tony arrives in the Iron Man suit and begins to scan the place for signs of life. After a quick glance, Tony says that there are three signals, and he asks how many people were in the facility. Nick's eyes go wide as he tells him that there were 38 people here. Tony hurries over to the three signals and says that he found Hank. He's alive, but barely. A short while later, Nick gathers everyone at the shield base of Triskelon and begins to go over the footage of the outbreak. He explains to everyone that at the present moment, they are unable to locate any of the captives. The only way to pinpoint them is if they power up again. Dramatically changing their genetic structure would set off an alarm. Nick goes on telling everyone that it's possible that they need to watch out for any past relationships that these people had, or past grudges. And as Nick thinks about it, he realizes that Norman did have a grudge against Peter Parker. Not long after that, Peter sits in his school when a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent pulls him out of class. As the two walk down the hallway, Peter asks him who he is, and he explains that he is Agent Clay Quartermain from S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick Fury had orders to bring him in. Peter then asks, how does he know that he's with S.H.I.E.L.D.? Does he have some kind of identification? Clay holds out his watch, and on the screen, Nick tells him to get his tights and get his butt over there. A short while later, over at the base, Nick brings Peter into the control room and tells everyone that this is Spider-Man. Tony looks at him asking, did he pull out a time or something? He's kind of young. And Nick shouts, no, this is really him. Before they can get all high and mighty, he would like to point out that he has single-handedly beaten the crap out of everyone who has escaped, and the entire S.H.I.E.L.D. organization couldn't do that. Peter then asks, wait, escaped? Who? And Nick tells him, all of them. Peter shouts that he's got a warrant on May, but Nick tells him that he's got that covered. He has agents watching over both May and a Mary Jane. While everyone begins to prepare themselves, Peter says that he needs to call Mary Jane. No, no dear so me, he me the right. Phone from Peter and shouts that he just lost 35 people today. That's more than he's ever lost since he took this job. Now, if he won't listen to them, he will ship his butt back to Queens and let him fend for himself. The room falls silent as everyone looks and Peter says that he doesn't understand. No, I hate the point where I hate my drawing. As Nick looks at the monitor with Norman on it, uh, he says that so he'll find back. out soon enough. Because I can't really think where to go next. He word from his secretary that Norman Osborn is on the line for him. Stone grabs the phone and says that this is Stone. And then he hangs up the phone. He walks into the president's office and says they have a serious situation with Nick Fury. A few hours later, Nick sits in the Oval Office while the president yells, asking how is it that criminals that he didn't even know about ended up calling the White House. Not only does Norman Osborn want $100 million, but he also wants his company back, his son, and amnesty for himself and a few others, along with the arrest of Nick Fury or else. Nick Fury asks him what is the what else. And the president goes back to shouting that he's threatening to expose the highly... Listening to uh, comics guys while I... Really um, detaining, or they will release that information worldwide. He think where I'm going to go next with this. There was a little concentration camp for supervillains behind his back. Uh, I'm, st I'm stuck. Or due process, they've also escaped. They're what do you think, guys? Let me know. Let me know. Off shouting, but he has until tonight to get this fixed. Now get out. As Nick Fury walks out of the office, his phone goes off, and when he answers, Norman says that he hopes that he will enjoy prison more than he did. This body shape is later, really bugging me. Base to get everyone ready to move out, and as he suits up, one of the operators shouts that they're currently being hacked. Everyone runs over to the computers, and Nick shouts for everyone to shut down the systems, and then the power goes out. Everyone stands still, and Peter begins to feel his spider sense going off. Just then, all of the lights begin to pop. And electricity shoots out, shocking most of the people. Max then floats down, telling everyone that he hopes they all like it like that. Any remaining agents open fire on Max, but the bullets fade through him. And he says that isn't going to work as well as they hoped. Suddenly, a rush of wind shoots by as sand begins to cloud everyone's vision. Peter tries to web up Max, but Flint forms a hammer of sand and cracks Peter in the head as he falls. Norman rips off the roof and jumps down, pinning Peter to the ground and he smiles, telling him, My boy. A little while later, Peter sits in a chair, beginning to hear the voices of Norman and Otto talking. When he opens his eyes, Norman looks down at him, telling him, There's my boy. 
Peter begins to look around and sees Craven changing shape, and he punches him, shouting, He's just a kid! Otto grabs Craven by the neck with a mechanical arm and slams him into a wall, and Otto tells him to be still. Norman then says, Obviously, Craven is the weakest of us, so he'll do best to keep quiet to behave. Craven wipes the blood from his mouth, telling him, Yeah, okay. Otto then picks Peter back up and sits him down, and Peter asks, Why do you keep calling me your boy? Norman leans down, telling him that it's because he is his greatest creation. If it wasn't for him and Otto, he wouldn't be Spider-Man. Norman goes on telling him that together they are all victims of Nick Fury here. And now you are one of us. So let's all make history. Peter breaks free from the chair, shouting for him to shut up, and he jumps onto the wall. He then says that if he thinks for a second that he's going to help him. But Norman then holds out his arm, stopping him, telling him, Andre will die tonight. And if you still can't behave, then it will be Mary Jane. And then her family. As Norman keeps listing off things, Peter tells him, fine, okay, just leave Aunt May alone. Back over at the White House, Stone gets on the call from Norman and he asks, how is everything working out? Stone says that he's sorry, but the White House just doesn't work like that. He can't cough up $100 million. Norman cuts him off, telling him, well, that's really too bad. And then he hangs up. The president then asks everyone if they got a hit on his location, and the lights go out. Suddenly, electricity shoots out of all of the electrical devices, and then there's a loud boom coming from outside. Soldiers stationed outside begin firing towards the explosion, and then another wave of electricity shoots out, frying them all. From the smoke and the fire, Norman, along with Peter, steps out, stating that this will do. As everyone walks towards the White House, they all start to hear a loud humming. When they look up, they see the shield helicarrier flying by. Captain America steps up and points to Norman, telling him, You're trespassing. Without even responding, Norman and the rest of them clash with the Ultimates, and all Peter can do is stand there and watch. Norman grabs him and puts him in front of Captain, telling him to do something useful. As Peter nervously pulls his arm back to swing, Captain America asks, What are you doing? Peter stutters, telling him that he has to, or on May's going to. Peter then grabs onto Captain America and he tells him, Norman won't. We have her over the helicarrier. While the two of them struggle, pushing each other back, Peter asks, You promise? You swear you have her? And Captain America looks at him and says, Okay. Peter lets go, and he looks back to Norman, calling him out. Norman shouts that he told him to! But before he can finish, Peter cracks him across his goblin face. He then jumps on top of him, shouting that he's sick of having him in his life! And then one of Otto's mechanical arms grabs him. Mm okay, we're getting more into the uh, muscle structure now, guys. Peter gets back up, he says, so this is the Oval Office, huh? I wasn't back happy the way it was. So I'm just sort of faffing with things. As it's still in the sketch stage. Sketching takes a long time to be happy with it. You draw yourself, guys. You'll know what I mean. You're never really completely happy with what you've drawn until you basically cut it in. If you can hear something in the background, that is... Um, there's comic story. They're reading comics while I... Norman sort of get this drawn. Then he needs to stop. Norman stops just helps it a little bit. Saying, Nick, I sucked to a new Lou using my own child. And Harry tells him no. He came on his own, so please just stop all of this. While they talk, Tony watches and tells the helicarrier to go ahead. Load Osborne's genetic sequence. He has a clear shot. Harry then looks back at the White House and sees Peter. Norman stands still and then slowly begins to revert back. When suddenly there's a flash and a bright blue blast hits Norman in the back. And as he falls, he shouts, I'll kill you all! Everyone on the ground begins to focus their attacks on Norman, and Nick walks up to Harry and tells him this wasn't a part of the plan. Peter rushes down to see Harry, and then there's another explosion in the sky. Everyone looks up to see a giant fall of electricity and then a prison fall from it. One of the soldiers asks, who just won? And as him and Tony aim, they see Thor float back to the ground asking if they're done yet. Peter turns back to Harry, hugging him, telling him that he didn't deserve any of this, and through his songs, Harry says, all of you. I'll kill all of you for this. Another soldier starts to walk Harry away, and Nick walks up to Peter, telling him that for a number of reasons, he needs to get out of here. They will get him back to New York within the hour. They've got Harry under control. A little while later, Peter heads over to the helicarrier and is told to tell Aunt May that he was also being held. Because of security, he was kept separate from her. She asks if she's, like, mad or anything, like on a scale of 1 to 10. As Peter and the agent walk into the next room, May screams that she will sue all of them if she doesn't see her nephew right now, right this instant. Peter runs over to hug her, and she tells the agents that she would very much like them to bring her home now. Elsewhere, in another lab loading bay, a cryogenic chamber is activated with the body of Norman Osborn. Captain America says they should just put a bullet in the back of his head, and Nick tells them that they can't, not until they get everything they need from his DNA. If the rain pours down, Captain America tells them that's right, because the next war will be a genetic one, and Nick Fury tells them, yeah, that's right. As the cab driver loads up Aunt May's luggage, May stands by Peter and Gwen's side, explaining that she's going to be gone at Florida for a week. She doesn't want any hanky-panky going on. 
But as Peter asks, what the heck is that? May tells him that he knows what she means. After the two of them wave goodbye, Peter goes back inside to have breakfast, and he begins to think about how this is a first. For once, there's no earth-shattering drama, no news about some villain attacking New York. Heck, even Jonah is being somewhat reasonable. And while Gwen makes herself breakfast, she has the news playing. The reporter says that they have an interview with Sam Raimi, the man who will be directing the new Spider-Man hmm. movie. Peter watches and Sam says that there isn't much known about Spider-Man, but he wants to capture his perception of it. Just imagine that this man was struck by tragedy, and he grows up to be a loser, and then he puts on a mask and everything changes. As Peter listens to Sam, for the most part, accurately describe his life, he doesn't realize until after that he just ripped the door off the hinges. Meanwhile, over at Riker's Island of Maximum Security Penitentiary, Otto Octavia sits in his cell, alone. One of the guards leans in on the cell, showing him a paper stating that there's a Spider-Man movie coming out. And I'll sharpen all that once I... To give it a little I'll sharpen all of this, this once I eat it, guys. On deluded, self-important murderers like him. Leave it to uh, the to cash in with a man's I'm getting... Right? We're getting closer. We're getting closer. He would feel bad if he wasn't a cop killer. And who knows? Maybe you could even go to the premiere. Later, as Otto lies in his bed, he feels a faded thunk, thunk, and he smiles. Not far off at the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, two scientists begin to hear a thump coming from a locker. They go to check it out. As soon as the locker is unlocked, Otto's mechanical arms shoot out and they begin crawling up into the air vents. The next day, the set of the new Spider-Man movie, actor Tobey Maguire pulls off the Spider-Man mask, shouting that he can't see a thing with this thing on. Just as Sam and the others go out to respond, their words trail off. And Toby looks around to see Peter, the actual Spider-Man, telling him, you suck. And then he points at everyone else, stating, you all suck and you should feel bad. He then jumps around the set shouting that the movie is totally going to tank because they're all fake and their actors can't do this. Peter then stops and asks Sam, how could you do this to me? You're making a movie without my permission. I'm Spider-Man. Sam smiles, telling him, actually, we don't need it. You're a public figure, so you're public domain. And the producer adds that he even got the rights of Octavius from his ex-wife. The producer then begins asking, what are these men like? What kind of men are Otto and Norman Oswald? All right, Here without further ado, I think we're going to have to stop it in there. Uh, Spider-Man, he's here in the suit and no one's listening to us. More shouts, detail to Spidey's outfit. Back on Rikers Island, Otto sits up in his bed and he smiles and he hears the explosions going off and the guards shouting for help. As the mechanical arm slips into the cell, he says, yes, I missed you too. Now it's time for us to leave. A short while later, in another part of town, Otto knocks on a door that happens to be a man's house. And when the man asks what does he want, Otto tells him that he has a really nice house. The man asks, do I know you or something? And then suddenly there's a crash from behind and the mechanical arms begin to crawl in. Otto tells the man, I really like your house. Meanwhile, at school, Kong tells everyone that he just got a part in the Spider-Man movie as an extra. While the students all gather around to listen, Gwen overhears and asks if there's a part in the movie where Spider-Man kills her dad. Everyone just looks at her, and Gwen mutters, so stupid, under her breath as she storms off. Peter and Mary Jane watch, and they chase after her. Peter tells her that they know it wasn't Spider-Man that killed her father. It was, but Gwen cuts him off. Yeah, there was some guy in a Spider-Man costume that doesn't matter. It's all Spider-Man. A guy dressed as Spider-Man killed my dad, and now they want to make a movie about him? Gwen turns and walks out shouting, Yeah, make a hero out of him! Make a movie! And dolls! Yippee! Peter tells Mary Jane that he could really use a crazy villain to beat the crap out of right now. Back at Otto's newly acquired house, he talks to the mechanical arms as they flip through the channels on the TV and stuff on the news. The reports begin to talk about the new Spider-Man movie and how they're lucky enough to speak with Rosalita Octavius, the estranged wife of Dr. Otto Octavius. The camera then switches to Rosalita talking about Otto and how he's a tragic failure. And as the news plays, the mechanical arms rip the TV off the wall and they smash it on the ground. And Otto says, ah, this is perplexing. Up in one of the buildings is Peter, watching as they film. And as the actors start to get ready for a break, there's a loud crash and people screaming. When everyone looks over, they see Otto making his way through, destroying everything in his path. He calls out for Rosalita, telling her how disappointed that we are for what you've done. One of the mechanical arms begins to reach out, but it's stopped as Peter webs it up, saying, You can't do this. How could you be out and about doing this to me again? And Otto just looks back and says, Mr. Parker. The mechanical arms begin to grab Peter, and Peter shouts, All of the sucky things you made me do. Now you're making me fight you so that you don't trash the movie set that I already hate. As the arms flail about, one manages to knock Peter down, and Otto screams at him to just die! The arms then shoot out, and just before it hits Peter, he quickly catches it. And Otto asks, Why is it that everywhere I go, Spider-Man is always there? Peter then struggles to push the arm back and says, because I love you. And then Otto whips Peter into the air and Peter asks, how is it that you keep escaping? I'm no expert or anything, but I'm starting to really think that there needs to be a security upgrade of these prisons. As Peter tries to fight back against Otto, Otto manages to knock him back into the ground and then he wraps an arm around Peter's neck. As he's lifted up into the air, Peter says, you've become a much better fighter. Otto then electrifies an arm and smacks Peter with a stating, we 
I've had a great deal of time to consider how to fight you if we ever met again. Peter asks who this we stuff is that he's already talking about because he's already a whacked out wackety whack job. And one of the actors runs in screaming, Oh my god, don't kill me! And both Peter and Otto just stare at him. So then Otto keeps Peter in the air, and one of the Spider-Man stuntmen grab a camera, and they bash it into the side of Otto's head. Peter asks, who are you? The man says that his name is Leroy, and this guy is gone and shut down. You the are a junkie! Oh, Otto then gets up swinging his arm, knocking Leroy away. And then Peter catches one of the arms and swings Otto into a production van. Just as he swings again at the row Otto is signed, Peter's grabbed by another arm, and he's tossed out into the street. Meanwhile, back at Peter's home, the doorbell rings, and when Gwen goes to check it, she sees Mary Jane. Gwen opens the door, and Mary dances in, telling her that her mother finally kicked her father out. She's not forever grounded from the whole running away thing. She then calls out for Peter, and Gwen tells her that he's not really here. He's at work or something. And Gwen says that she'll hang out until he gets back. She needs to relax anyway. But just before they sit on the couch, they both see the news, and they see that Spider-Man is fighting Otto again. And now Spider-Man's defending everyone. Gwen watches it angrily, and Mary Jane watches, stating that she's got to go. Uh, she forgot something, and she runs out the door. However, Gwen notices that there was something strange about that. Back on the set, the fighting brought Peter and Otto into the tunnels, where Otto throws Peter against a wall, and a mechanical arm quickly grabs him again and throws him into a car. And just as the spider sense goes off, Otto hits him again, slamming him into another car. Peter looks up, and then his vision begins to fade. And when he opens his eyes, he tries to move, and then he sees that he's duct taped to a chair. I don't know that. Right, it'll be. That's when he hears a voice telling him, Ah, oh, good, you're awake. Otto walks out of the cockpit, telling him that it's a lovely night to be flying, Mr. Parker. I actually thought that he would be grounded for being out this late on a school night. He then pulls off Peter's mask, and Peter asks, What kind of goofy goofball thing are you going to do to me now? So Otto hits him with a mechanical arm, and Peter shouts, God, you knocked the tube loose! Otto tells him, I'm sorry about that, but let's take a look. I haven't talked to him after all. The mechanical arms hold Peter's head in place while another one reaches in, grabbing the wiggling tooth and rips it out of his head. Peter screams, and then with another arm, Otto webs up Peter's mouth, telling him, This is the cute toy that you have. And I thought that the webbing came out of your body mechanically. Peter tries to break free, but Otto tells him, You're only here for one purpose, and that's courtesy. A break glass in case of emergency situation. He sits down, telling him, The way I see it, I need something in case I run into any trouble when we land. I have you to be used. But there's one thing that I want to tell you. I hate everything about you. The biggest thing was this whole wanting to do good thing. Deep down, you're just a pathetic, immature glory hound. In fact, I'm truly disgusted by you, Mr. Parker. There's always someone standing in Whether it be you, Rosalina, Norman, there's always someone. Why can't you people just leave me alone so that I can live a decent life? Why is that so hard? Otto leads back and he tells him, just so you know, you will be killed tonight. They will kill you. And as Otto goes on, Peter passes out from the pain. The pilot says it will be arriving shortly. Otto walks back up to the cockpit and he hears the pilot speaking to the control tower about the landing. And then there's a sudden boom! Otto runs back out to see the door open and Peter gone from his chair. And he looks outside screaming, Parker! That looks like a Gwen doesn't feel quite so right that Mary Jane just up and left at news of Spider-Man. So she decides to go into Peter's face. While she looks around, she sees Peter's locked chest and breaks the lock with a hammer. As it opens, her eyes widen as she sees the Spider-Man costume sitting inside. Once the plane touches down in Brazil, Otto says that he knows little Parker is out there. He pulls the pilot out, telling him that he did an exceptional job flying under what he is sure was not ideal flying conditions. But they have a little Spider-Man to deal with. Pilot says that he promised that he could live, so... But Otto steps off the plane, and then Peter jumps out of a car. Mm, okay, so we're, the we're now enough there now. We need now really is to... Um, Probably ink it. We can get more dark after. tones to it. Out and then colour that in. Otto gets back up, he starts to swing at the airport personnel. And so Peter jumps in, punching him back to the ground, telling him, just stay calm! Suddenly, Maybe Peter we should start working on the other one now. And soldiers start running at him, yelling at Portuguese. I'll just pull that picture up on the computer. And then from the crowd, a woman says, uh, I'm getting really fed up with that one, so I'm going to move over to the other one again. Peter points to Otto, telling them that it was this guy's fault. He kidnapped me to go wherever the heck this place is. And the woman tells him he's actually in Brazil. Peter then turns to the pilot, stating that he knows that he's had a bit of a rough night, but could you help me out and bring me back to New York? That'd be great. The female captain says they're not Maybe we should do a bit on the hands, actually. So Peter shouts, no, you don't understand. I have to get home or I'm going to be in so much trouble. But before they can be taken away, a passing plane gets ready to take off. Just before lifting up, Peter hops onto it and sticks to the plane. And then from hopping from plane to plane, he finally gets back to Queens. Peter rushes home before Aunt May is supposed to get back and he sneaks into the basement. Just as he pulls his mask off, he sees Gwen standing there crying, holding a gun at him. And through her crying, she says that it was him. Wasn't it? He's the one that killed her father. Peter asks, where did she even get the gun? And she shouts that it was her father's. She goes out screaming that it was Spider-Man. 
Spider-Man killed her father. He shouts that it wasn't him, it was the other guy in his Spider-Man costume. And then the two near the front door open as Aunt May gets back from her trip. Peter quickly snatches the gun and he tells Gwen that she needs to listen to him. He didn't kill her father. Yes, he's Spider-Man, but he would never kill anyone. Plus, he was with really? her the day that it happened. Her dad was in Atlantic City. They were here. There's no way that he could have been there. And he tells her that she needs to please believe him. No one knows about this. And Aunt May cannot handle this sort of thing. As May continues calling, asking who's home, Peter slowly removes his hand from Gwen's mouth. She doesn't say anything, and then she turns to leave, slamming the basement door shut. May calls out asking if anyone is down there, and Peter comes up stating that he just fell asleep at his computer. He's sorry for not coming up right away. May tells him it's all right, and then she sees the bruise on Peter's cheek. She asks what happened, and Peter says, oh, he got hurt at the gym. The tooth even popped out, but it's fine. May tells him it's not okay. They're going to set up an appointment to have the dentist and look at that tomorrow. The next day, Peter laid in bed as Mary Jane comes home from school. She tries to gently wake him, but he jumps up shouting, don't! And he spits out bandages from his mouth. Both scream, falling back, and Peter says, oh, hey. She hugs him, telling him that she was so worried. Everyone's been talking at school about the whole fight. And then he says, actually, was Gwen at school? Mary Jane says, no, why? Peter tells Mary Jane that Gwen found out. Mary Jane quietly says that she may have looked a little suspicious, running out of the house when the news was showing him fighting Doc Ock. Peter sighs, asking what is he supposed to do now, and a voice says that she was going to find out sooner or later. Peter sees Gwen and asks, where did she go? She tells him that at first, just in the backyard for like an hour, at the movies and the library. Mary Jane asks what she's doing there, and Gwen says she was just reading up stuff on Spider-Man and her father. Peter asks that she knows that he didn't kill her father, right? And Gwen says, yes, yeah, sorry, she kind of wigged out on one time. Peter brushes it off, telling her not to worry. They're all kind of spazzing out. So Gwen jumps on the bed, stating that this all makes so much more sense now. The reason Peter Parker is a total flake. And Mary Jane says that he was a flake before this whole thing happened. Gwen then says that he knows that she wasn't going to shoot, right? Peter says, yeah. He has spider sense that lets him know when something dangerous is about to happen. You just don't tell anyone. So as everything for Peter is wrapping up, later the night at Stark Industries, S.H.I.E.L.D. soldiers begin to gather, and a van pulls up. And from it, Otto is escorted to where Nick Fury is standing. Nick introduces himself to Otto and tells him that one of the decisions that he made was to keep the mechanical arms intact while their scientists examined how they worked. But as of now, they know that that was a mistake. They have misjudged how strong the connection he had to them once. So that is why he's being brought here and sedated enough not to control him. But not so much as to pass out. Nick then gives an order. The mechanical arms are dropped into the vat of molten metals. And Otto shouts, no, it's on him! They had nothing to do with this! Oh, uh, just checking those uh, comments there. leaving Nick into the fire and tells the guards to just keep an eye on those things, just in case. What's the point? Um, just purely because I got somebody asking me to draw, and uh, I like to draw, so I thought I'd do it live. And uh, I'm listening to a few comics while I do draw, guys. So it's sort of, it's sort of a live event all day, every day, or uh, well, every day, uh, all day today, I should say. So I'm uh, just sort of drawing live. Um, yeah, any point is so you can see from the very first sketch. Let me turn that down a bit so I don't have to shout over that. Uh, so uh, when I do draw, because right, I said I did start out with a tiny little sketch like this, did all the wireframing. Now I'm doing a little bit more detail to it. And like you said there, dude, why is, what's the point of doing it live? So just like that, so people can chat to me, leave some comments, tell me where I'm going wrong, tell me where I'm doing, if I'm doing okay. And just sort of generally... Keep in contact, as this is going to be my Wednesday every week, maybe a Thursday as well. But uh, as I, I like to draw, I like to uh, share what I'm drawing and how I draw it and uh, how long it takes me to do it. Because there was this uh, idea that taking doing a drawing only takes you five or ten minutes to an hour. Well, I've been here for an hour and 23 minutes. And uh, so far, it's taken me that long just to get this far on the general sketch. His uh, drawing does drawing anything really takes uh, takes a lot of time, and if you want to try and sort of get it into a close enough to what you think should be, it uh, it uh, does take a while. So, but at the moment, what do you think, guys? Because I'm I'm getting to a point where I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the sketch part of it and um, move on to color and ink. But I'm more likely going to take this to, once I've inked it, that is, take it to the critter file. And then later on tonight, uh, continue on and color it in. But, and I'm going to be uh, on the critter. I'm going to be putting a background to it as well. I've used, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm going to be putting a background to this as uh, 
background is just just takes a that little bit longer anyway. I'm using a mechanical pencil at the moment, and uh, like I, like I think, to be honest with you, if I do too much more to this, all it's going to be is horrible sketchy lines. So I'm going to leave it there for the sketch side. I will work a bit more on the hand, but because uh, they're working on the hand at the moment up in here, and I'll do this one here: the feet, the legs, and the chest, and the arms look fair enough, good enough to me. Um, but they are really sketchy, but that's because I haven't inked them yet. But I will um, will be doing them in, in in ink, which if it's all fine line inks that I'll be using, as long as my pen still works. But I, I can't see why not. Yeah, I'll be using that one later on, guys, to ink it. And, uh, yeah, guys, I'll be coloring in as well with a few Copic markers. But first, I will take that over to uh, Critter once I've inked it, because once it's inked, it's a lot more darker. I can take a picture and then transfer that to my Critter, which Critter is basically um, Photoshop. It's just free to everybody that wants it. So thank you very much for that comment, and keep them coming. That at the moment, I am looking for um, the, well, this one here. I did start drawing this one, so now I'm going to get more sharper on this one, get a bit more um, closer to what it should be body size. At least just sort of hanging off the wall. I'm thinking uh, this one is going to be sort of uh, a Spidey um, from the from the game, or as close as I can get it. Uh, obviously, because I haven't seen anything other than the pictures that you see on online, so that's as close as I get to Spidey as normal when I draw him. But uh, I do need to finish this one off, so I'm going to start on this one now, and possibly come back to this one uh, today. Oh, I know today I will be finishing this one. I will be inking that, and I will be uh, inking this one at some point today. But at the moment, I'm uh, just. Drawing away, kind of shaping and shading. Let's turn that back up again while I look for the picture. Hopefully you can hear that okay. Around the back to see if Peter's in the basement, but as she gets there, she finds that it is also locked. 
and that's when she hears something behind him. She asks if it's Peter, but without answering, the red figure comes out of the bushes. Gwen says no while trying to back up, but the figure opens its mouth um, and grabs a hold of I can't find the actual picture I drew. What's drawing from? That's annoying. Just as Gwen's vision oh, there we go. She sees the creature's face begin to form. Nope, that ain't it. Peter's face. The tendril then pulls out of Gwen's stomach, and the figure vanishes, leaving Gwen's body in the grass. A short while later, Aunt May returns home from work and begins calling out, asking if anyone's there. With no answer, she figures that she'll just make some food for Peter and Gwen when they get home. And as she looks out of the window into the backyard, she sees Gwen's body. Over the Daily Bugle, Peter finishes reading the article that Jonah posted that Spider-Man has actually done some good because he stopped the Punisher, and then the phone rings. Peter answers it and tells Aunt May hello, and she tells him what she found. Peter hands up the phone, and he rushes home to see the cops and the EMTs on the scene. And he starts to push his way through the crowd. As he gets to the backyard, he sees Gwen's body covered, and he overhears Aunt May talking to some of the police. As Jean arrives, she speaks with some of the other detectives and says that it's a shame. The same thing happened earlier today at the Empire State University. Oh, lab. damn Once it, I've lost the picture. Leave, Aunt tries to get a hold of Gwen's mother, but she isn't having much luck. Mm -hmm. Mary yeah, Jane's mother go. offers to let Peter and all may stay with the Watsons for the night, and Peter says that that might actually be a good idea. Later, as he sits on a fold-out couch, Mary Jane comes down with a pillow asking if he knows who did this. Peter says that he's not sure. He's not even sure if this could be related to him being Spider-Man. Mary Jane leads back telling him it's awful. She may be the last person to have talked to her. Earlier at the mall, they ran into each other, and they had a totally cool talk, like they were really becoming friends. Peter right asks, so what's the point of all of this? Can Save that, so I can put it into my... Like Peter begins to cry, Mary Jane hugs him until he falls asleep. That's Over a point. short while no, later, Peter sits back up, thinking about all of the possibilities of who could have... Bear with me, guys. The detective has mentioned that it could have been a new... So was it Wolverine, Otto Octavius, Norman? And then he remembers something that Gene mentioned. The same thing happened at Empire Space University. And then an image of Kirk Connors as a lizard crosses his mind. He gets up and he looks up the window towards his house and he sees Kurt standing there. He grits his teeth and he heads outside, punching Kurt, calling him a monster. He jumps on top of him, hitting him, shouting, What did you do? What did you do to my life? And as the rage begins to take over, Peter picks Kurt up. And Kurt tries to explain that there was an accident at the lab. Peter sets him down, asking, What accident? And Kurt goes on telling him that they inadvertently created a rejuvenating organism and it escaped. Peter shouts asking them, what did you do? And Kurt explains that they were running tests and splicing the DNA with things and none of it was working. So they dug through some of his father's old notes until they found something about cell reconstruction. Peter looks at Kurt stating, you spliced my altered DNA using my father's stolen work just to see what would happen? Kurt remains silent and Peter tells him, that is the most disgusting thing I could have ever imagined. And then there's a rustle from the bushes. Peter's spider sense begins to go crazy and then out of the bushes walks the red creature. As it walks forward, its face begins to change and as its face starts to look like Peter's, it tries to talk. Peter stumbles back shouting and the creature starts to change back and screams as it shoots a tendril forward. Peter narrowly dodges it and then he jumps back trying to fight off the creature. He shouts for Kurt to get back to his lab and find a way to kill this thing. But once he's done, if he has to find a way to kill it, he's going to lock the two of them into a room together. Peter grabs a hold of one of the tendrils and he pulls the creature up to a roof to get it away from the people while Kurt speeds off. As the two of them struggle, the fighting brings them into the city where they both crash into different buildings. Peter gets up looking down asking what has Spider-Man brought into this world. That thing has his face in is killing people. He's failed at what he's supposed to be doing. And that's how people, as the creature gets up and looks at Peter and it starts to escape. So he changes after it, and just as the creature lands on a police car, Peter follows shortly after slamming it back down. The creature throws Peter away, and the two officers of the car belong to open fire. The bullet shoots through the creature, and then it throws two of its tendrils at the officers. Peter gets up and he watches the creature absorbing them. And then it changes again, this time into a much more fully formed body. Back over at the lab, Kurt rushes inside, and as the doors open, he sees Peter's shadow standing there. He asks what happened, and Peter stares at him, telling him, it's done. The creature grew and formed, and we fought. The more that we fought, I started to see its face, and it was my face. It was my father's face. And then there was a moment of hesitation, but deep down, I knew what I had to do. So I brought the fight to the smokestacks and threw the creature's body inside. After falling into the fire, the creature tried to pull itself out, but in the end, it let go. As Peter finishes the story, Kurt says that he's sorry that he had to, and then Peter grabs him, shouting, sorry? He pulls his fist back, shouting, you murdered these people, you killed Gwen! But before before Peter could hit Curry, lets go and silently says, You killed Gwen. A little while later, down at the police station, Kurt walks in and tells the detectives that his name is Kurt Connors, and he thinks he may have accidentally murdered people. Back over at Mary Jane's house, the alarm clock shows 7.42, and Mary Jane wakes up to see Peter just sitting there. She asks if he got any sleep, and then sees his face covered in dirt and scratches. She then asks if he caught the guy who did this, and tells him that she that's could have gotten not good. Costume. He tells her no. No more costume. He's done. I can't he even say it. Done with what? He says, with Spider-Man. No more. However, Back at the lab, Ben arrives to work when he sees the officers going through Kurt's research. He asks what's going on. The dean of the school says they're shutting down the lab. The experiment that Kurt was working on is what killed those... Just going to have to work with what I got. That as of 
now he's currently out of a job. So oh, I'm going to say Ben heads over because the pen. Starting to get a little bit frustrated now, guys. So I might take a five minute break in a moment or two. Step away for a couple of two. As the sun rises over the Parker home, Peter can hear Aunt May shouting for him to get up or he's going to be late. He finally comes downstairs and he looks around asking what the hell is going on. And May tells him that she knows that they're not moving yet. But getting a head start on packing is a bit more relaxing. As May goes on talking, Peter doesn't respond to her and she tells him that someone's awfully grumpy. Peter heads downstairs and starts to look around, sniffing things. Before he can go anywhere though, Mary Jane flips on the light stating that the whole point of having a boyfriend is to have someone to walk to school with. So hurry up and get ready. Peter looks around asking, school? And Mary Jane says that it's not her most ideal place for a date, but that's the best that they can do for the day. And she kisses Peter. As she hugs him, Peter just smiles awkwardly. Meanwhile, in a dirty motel room, Logan, the man known as Wolverine, begins to wake up asking, what the heck is that smell? Logan looks around at his arm asking, what is this? Why am I so hairy? He jumps out of bed, running to the bathroom, asking himself, What is going on? And then he looks at his arm as his claws pop out, stabbing through it. Back over at the Parker home, Mary Jane asks Peter, What does he mean by he's not going to school? Is something going on? Is that a Spider-Man thing? Peter asks, What? And then tells her, Yeah, go get the costume and leave it here. As Peter closes the door to the basement, Aunt May shouts to Peter that he needs to answer her when she calls for him. There's someone on the phone from the Daily Bugle. He grabs the phone and Logan shouts, What the heck did you do? What you and Freak think did you do to put me in the hairy beast of a body? And why are you stinky like a dog? Now that we've figured it all out, Logan is in Peter's body and Peter's in Logan's body. Logan, in Peter's body, says, Look, kid, I really don't know what's going on either. And Peter, in Logan's body, says, Whatever is happening, you need to go to school for me. Now, to keep things less confusing at this point forward, we are going to be referring to Peter as Peter, who will be referring to Logan as Logan. But regardless of the body that they are in, that is how we're going to be referring to them. So when I say Logan, I mean Logan and Peter's body. So just so you know what's going on. Logan tells him no. And Peter shouts, I'm already oh, I hate that. Day. You just go to school. I'll meet you there. As Peter yells, he mistakenly pops the claws out, cutting the payphone in half, as well as cutting off his own pinky. Peter shouts to someone to help him, and then he sees the pinky growing back, and he says, uh, well, never mind. And he runs off. A little while later, Logan walks around looking at the cheerleaders, and Mary Jane tells him to wipe the drool off. Logan asks if they're really allowed to wear those sort of things. And Mary Jane shoves him in the back, asking, what the hell is your problem? She storms off. Logan takes a look at the costume and says, that isn't happening. As he wanders around the school, a security guard tries to stop him, asking why he's in class. Logan turns the corner, and the guard chases after him. And when he does, he doesn't see Peter, because Logan is hanging off of the wall, waiting. But not knowing how to control Peter's powers, they end up failing him. He gets up after hitting the guard, and Peter runs at Jetty. Stop it! What are you going to do, kill him? But Peter stares at him and says, Oh, God, you are in my body. What kind of mutant? And Logan stops him, telling him, How do I know it wasn't you that did this? Peter points and shouts, and a claw pops out, hitting Logan. And Logan asks, What the hell is that buzzing? Peter then explains that it's his spider sense, but look, we can figure this out. Right now, we just need to go to class. And Logan does a fine, and he heads in. And Peter waits for Logan to come back out. He sees a group of men driving by the school, shooting at the police. Peter, still thinking that he's in his body, runs in to try and stop the men, but he ends up jumping and bouncing off of the thug's car and landing on the police car, which then causes it to plow into the thug's car. He looks up seeing the thug's car flying towards him, and he says, This is gonna hurt. And back inside of the class, all of the students watch the accident. Logan quietly says, Idiot kid. As the cops surround Peter, they tell him to freeze, and he tries to tell him, Totally cooperating and stuff. And another cop shouts for him to put his hands up, so Peter does, and he accidentally pops the claws out again. The cops tell him to put those away, and they retract. But then they pop out again. Peter says, Oh, <coughs> He looks at the cops, I'm really sorry, but I have to go. And he starts to run, and then the cops taser him. A short while later in the jail cell, the cops hand Peter the phone, telling him that he gets to make one call, but no sudden moves. Peter takes the phone, and he calls over to the only place that he knows that might be able to help, Charles Xavier's school. Kitty answers the phone, and Peter asks who is this, and Kitty says, who's this? Frustrated. Peter says, look, I'm the guy you meant before, to be Spider-Man. And Kitty says, right, say hi to the hall for me. Peter shouts, I'm serious, I'm stuck in the body of your teammate. I just woke up and suddenly I was like this. We switched bodies or something. Kitty listens, and then bursts out laughing. <laughs> Handing the phone to Storm, stating that she just can't. As Storm answers, Peter gets frustrated and pops the claws, cutting the phone in half. He then looks up and sees the cops all pointing their tasers, and they shot him again. A little while later, Peter sits up in his cell, stating that, all things considered, it's nice here. And then the sounds of guns going off rings throughout the jail cell. Peter sees Logan fighting all the cops, and as the gun goes off, Peter watches he gets caught in the crossfire and it hits him in the head. Peter shouts, what did you just do? And Logan tells him, look, hop out a claw and jam it into the lock so we can get out of here. Peter asks, how? I can't even control these things. And Logan says, just think about it and flick. Suddenly, a single claw pops out, and Logan says, there, now punch the lock. 
Once the two of them get outside, Logan tells Peter to hang on a second, and he pulls the bullet out of Peter's skull. He goes on saying, look, Bob, you're taking really bad care of my body. Peter ignores him, asking, where's the rest of my costume? And Logan says, I am not wearing your stupid costume. I'm done wearing this mask. It's smelly. You want to talk about smelly? You need to do a full body shampoo and wash everywhere. As the two begin to argue again, an explosion goes off, and the sounds of people screaming can be heard. Peter says immediately, stop this, and Logan shouts, no, we're in the middle of something here. Peter leaves up from the ledge of the building, telling him, I'm sorry, come with me or not, I gotta go. Down on the streets, the bank robber destroys the car, shouting that he'll do it again, but this time with their faces. So Peter jumps down, and the robber sees Logan, and he says, oh no, not again. And Peter tries to be nice to the guy, and Logan tells him, hey, I got an image to keep over here. The two begin to bicker yet again, and Logan webs up the robber and then flings him towards them. Peter cracks the man in the face, and before they can get back to each other's throats, Peter and Logan see Gene and the rest of the X-Men appear. Gene walks over to Peter, saying that she told him to stop hitting. Asks, what? Hey guys, welcome to the stream. I'm just taking myself a quick five as I'm getting a bit frustrated now. I've been doing this for about uh, hour and 40 minutes now. That's uh, still in the sketch stage. Uh, I'm going to be using ink very shortly. I keep tuned or listen to the comment that I'm listening to at the moment. Not because you're viewing, it's because of insert long string of censored insults. Here live every day on YouTube. Sometimes I draw, sometimes I game, and hence my name, Luke084, uh, and games. Now, the only real significant thing that you need to know about over the last It is a live event today. I'll be live all day today. Within, obviously, needing to eat and things, reasons and stuff. But uh, at the time, uh, bear with me, listen to the uh, comic being read to you, and I will... Uh, Straight Get up, back to my crap. He starts to throw more rings, and Peter dodges them, asking, What does that even mean? Says, When did being from Maryland ever be cool? Ringer that tells him, That's right, chuckle it up, beauty. I'm going to be walking out there with all of these diamonds. And Kitty Fry then floats down behind Ringer, telling him, You really need to knock it off with the whole racist thing. Ringer turns back, firing his rings at her, and as they face through Kitty Fry, because her power is the ability to face through walls, solid objects, and just about anything else, she tells him that, as he can tell, this whole stick won't really work for her. She grabs and starts phasing through Ringer, looking to yeah, step away, guys. Suit. Make a cup of but tea. Peter calls out, telling her that he's actually having a bit of a problem trying to breathe here. Kitty runs back over to Peter, telling him that this might feel a bit weird. So, a few seconds later, she takes Peter by the shoulders and phases him through the rings. And Peter says, "Thanks. Now I have no shirt." Kitty laughs, telling him that's a bonus for her then. And now the hula hoop guy is getting away. So he should probably whip the crap out of him. Up ahead, Ringer starts running, but before getting away, a wall of web is sprayed all in front of him. Ringer turns back to attack, and Peter webs up his hands. But rather than stopping, Ringer continues to try and generate more rings. As he does, Kitty sees that she couldn't short him out because of the device on his back. However, as Ringer boosts his power, he ends up blowing up the pack as it's aimed towards Kitty. Peter shouts for her to get back, but after the explosion, Kitty says that he really needs to remember that her face and power lets her not get hurt and stuff. Peter tells her, sorry, just a knee-jerk reaction. He puts back on his shirt, and Kitty says that she notices something on Ringer's phone. She pulls out his wallet and asks, what kind of a supervillain brings this to a robbery? And then she proceeds to flip through it. She starts to laugh when she says, the guy's name is Anthony Davis. He's from Medina County, Iowa. The officers start to arrive on the scene, and Peter says that this is probably where they should, like, get the heck out of here. And a short while later, in Peter and Kitty's abandoned warehouse hideaway, Kitty asks Peter if something's wrong. It seems like he had a bit on his mind today. Peter tells her, yeah, this is on. He really doesn't want to have to tell her that he's Spider-Man. It would really just be too much for her. Kitty tells him that, like, 80% of the things that happen, happen because he's Spider-Man. All she wants to do is be able to go to the movies and, like, hold hands. She then says that he should start to think of it this way. If his aunt knew that he had a girlfriend, it would give him more excuses to not be home and off doing superhero stuff. Peter asks if they would hide that she's a mutant. Kitty tells him no. He doesn't hide the fact that she's an expert. But before the two of them can go any further, the remote-controlled X-plane arrives to take Kitty back home. Peter says that he really needs to get a robot-controlled plane sometime. And as the two of them say their goodbyes, Kitty asks if he still likes her, which Peter simply kisses her. But before that can go any further, Kitty phases through, stating, uh, she didn't know how to break up the kiss, so hopefully that wasn't too freaky. A short while later, as Kitty arrives back at the X-Men, she notices that there is no one home. After setting down her bag in the kitchen, she sees Logan appear, and she happily says, You came back! Without saying a word, Logan pulls out a knife, and he lunges at her. She quickly phases through, and then she runs into the next room, where she's shot with a bolt of electricity. She then asks if that's Aurora, and Storm asks, what's that? Is that even a word? Whatever. And then 
then she shoots another bolt of electricity. Kitty phases out of the lower levels and runs into the control room, accidentally shorting out the control panel. The doors of the room start to open, and that's when Kitty looks back to see the automated controls are still active, and she pushes a button. Back in the Parker household, Aunt May tells Peter that she's going out for a bit. With a group of friends from work, so Peter smiles, telling her, have a good time. And after she leaves, he notices the X-plane hovering over the warehouse. He suits up and makes his way over, and when he boards it, he finds no one there. But before he can get back out of it, though, the hatch door slams shut, and the jet rockets off to the Westchester Mansion. As the jet is landing, Peter walks up to the front door of the mansion, asking if anyone's there, specifically Kitty Fry. Kitty opens the door, and Peter says that he's pretty sure the jet's broken to drag him all the way out here, but why is my spider sense going crazy? Is Logan here? Without saying anything, Kitty hits Peter with a stun gun. Once he hits the ground, he looks up to see Kitty's face start to change, and her saying, Far out! It's Spider-Man! There's something you didn't expect. Deadpool steps back to his group of cyborgs, stating, BONUS! A little while later, Peter begins to open his eyes, and when he sees him and the other X-Men bound up and chained, he looks around asking, Where am I? And a voice shouts, One of them is awake! Deadpool and, uh, says, uh, Just notice your comment there, buddy. Just cookie. reading that second. Asks, Can I hit him again? Huh. No, I'm not making chocolate milk, mate. <laughs> making a cup of tea. I'm not that young, buddy. Asks, Are you just going to drop us? And Deadpool says, you've all got wacky mutant powers. You can handle it. Besides, you're all going to be dead by nightfall anyway. That's the show. But if you want, wake them all up before you kick them off of the ship. Actually, it would be fun hearing them scream. The first cyborg says that he really wants to take the mask off of Spider-Man. But Deadpool stops him, telling him, hey, show some respect to the mask. Masks mean something. Respect that. He then leans over to Peter, telling him, time to rise and shine. Peter asks, who are you? Deadpool then says not to push them out. And seconds later, Peter is thrown out of the helicopter. He falls from the sky and he quickly positions himself to fire a web up to catch himself, which then throws him back into the air. Before crashing back into the ground, though, he sees the other X-Men pushing out, all wearing the same metal cuffs. And as he hits the ground, he asks, where the heck am I? Did I really just fall out of a plane? So I'm I did. listening Did's to um, my boot. Spidey, I read to you by so comic story, and if anybody's a follower. So he quickly jumps over the and that's side at the moment that's in the, sketch, the uh, sketch stage and he fires at just using pencil I was trying to have an inner model on here but I will be back very shortly guys but I need a quick break because I've been streaming for the that, last that, hour and 45 minutes and as this is a lot uh, webbing up the rest of that side a live event today this is stage one hashtag one on pencil soon or later on I'll be going to the he shouts, Next stage was ink, <clears throat> and then after that, I will be uh, going over to Critter, oh, the uh, free, and everybody, and, and as close to a fairly shop as I've got to color it in. I want to take it over there, guys. You'll see what I mean. It, uh, it everything pops out a little bit more. But uh, this is obviously in the sketch and pencil stage. So if you guys do enjoy drawing, and you want to see how. How I got to this stage, rewind ever so slightly a bit more, and you'll see from the wired stage to uh, where I've got to now. After kicking one of the men away, Scott asks, Where are we? And Peter tells us that he's not sure. Maybe Six Flags Crazy Town. Also, you're welcome. As one of the last cyborgs are taken out, Colossus breaks the comps off of Scott, and Colossus begins to hear something. Peter tells him that it's either his gentle sobbing or that's when a cyborg with the lower half of a snake slips out, shouting, Am I on? Okay. Yeah, we'll mute it. My name is Bonebreaker, and I'm here to break your bones. Bonebreaker starts to fire into Colossus, and Peter grabs Scott to avoid the hit. As the blast lays into Colossus, Bonebreaker shouts that this is what he wants. He wants to kill them and have everyone see him do it. Scott starts firing back, and Peter asks, what does he mean by everyone? Bonebreaker shouts that they're ready for him. They sacrifice themselves for this. The mutants may have been born of powers, but they willingly gave up their bodies to allow them to hunt them. But before he could go any further, a bolt of lightning cracks down from the sky, shocking him. And Storm blows down asking, is everyone else really angry about this whole thing? Peter quietly says, whoa. And Scott asks Storm if she knows where they are. She tells him, yes. And creating a whirlwind to lift everyone up, she tells them all to look around. Scott says, Krakoa! They want us to crack Krakoa! Peter then asks, where's that? Hopefully off the coast of Long Island, right? Scott tells him, no, it's off the coast of Genosha in the South Pacific. And before he could go on, Colossus shouts, over there. The sounds of helicopters begin to get louder. They begin to fire on the group. Storm releases the whirlwind, dropping everyone, and then the helicopter starts to fall from the sky. As it crashes, a figure starts to walk out of the fire, and Kitty asks if everyone's okay. She runs up to Peter, telling him, thank God you're okay. And Peter grabs her, telling her, wait, you could be a shapeshifter. 
She leans in, whispering something, and Peter says, Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really you. Yeah. Nightcrawler ramps in, holding a cyborg arm, telling them all that it's time for payback. He does believe that they are the stars of the show. Angel then flies on holding Jean's body, saying that he found her hanging from a tree. He didn't know what to do. Scott grabs her, shouting for her to wake up, and after a few shakes, she shouts, Everyone, shout! She then asks where they are, and Scott tells her Krakoa Island, and she shouts, Are you kidding me? Peter then says, hang on, what the heck is Krakoa Island? And Kitty explains that it is an island prison for the the nation of Genosha, imprisons them and hunts them for sport, and then broadcasts it on TV. They were here last month, and they may have stuck their noses in when the professor told them not to. Peter then says, that sounds rather inhumane, and a voice tells him, that's one way of looking at it. Deadpool jumps out with his reavers, telling them that the other side of it is that you are sickening, unholy, genetic freaks who have no business being alive in the first place. Plus... You're international terrorists. By the way, my name is Deadpool, and I'm about to show you why. So smile, you're about to make television history. As the two teams begin to clash, Deadpool shouts that the one who collects the most mutant carcasses gets a case of the Colts keys. Peter then yells, I'm not a mutant! Not that there's anything wrong with that, and Scott tells everyone that they need to hurry and find high ground. The X-Men turn and fight their way back, while Scott shouts that they can't take this fight head on. They're just simply outmanned and outgunned here. Nightcrawler teleports behind Deadpool swinging, and Deadpool spins back, grabbing him by the throat, telling him, you must be the blue smelly one. You really should have listened to your captain and ran like hell. Peter swings and kicking Deadpool off and tells him, oops, I was running the wrong way. A short while up ahead, Peter and Kitty begin to look through the bushes. Peter tells them that they need to call someone, maybe Nick Fury. Kitty tells them, remember, Nick Fury hates you, but for what it's worth, she's really sorry about getting you mixed up in all of this. Please don't break up with her. Peter tells her, well, duh. Kitty asks if he's mad, and Peter shouts, of course I'm mad, but you didn't do this. Besides, I'm pretty sure that you'd be breaking up with me after I'm grounded for like seven years because I didn't come home. And then Kitty thinks about it. What about Professor Xavier? What did they do with him? Before anyone else could ask that question, Spider-Man's spider sense goes off, and he webs away from an explosion, and Kitty tells them that he is so going to break up with her a little way back. Scott tries to hold down the line, but Deadpool and the Reavers manage to knock off Scott's visor, knocking him to the ground. Up in the sky, Storm starts to take out the helicopters, giving the rest of them time to fight back. And as Peter punches Deadpool, he says, you know, if I was a lesser superhero, I would say something lame like, your show's been canceled, but that's totally not me. And Kitty tells him that the fact that he thought of it is a cause for concern. Peter grabs Deadpool and rips his mask off to reveal Xavier. And Xavier shouts to everyone, run. I beg you all to run. Everyone asks what is going on. And Peter shouts, wait a second. And he clocks Xavier. Kitty yells, what the heck are you doing? And Peter says, he's the dude with the thing. And Xavier shouts to hurry up and kill Spider-Man. He's one of them. And in the confusion, Deadpool posing as Xavier starts to fire into the crowd. As everyone tries to dodge, Peter says that he does have spider sense. They need to learn to trust the spider sense. The group begins to run up ahead, and when the coast is clear, Nightcrawler then asks where Scott. Back on the battlefield, Deadpool's putting back on his mask, telling everyone that they need to hurry and pull the legs off of Spider-Man. This isn't going so smoothly because we didn't plan for him. Meanwhile, up ahead, Peter and the rest of them press on. It storm spots the studio where they're broadcasting from. But before they can move, an electrical blast shoots Peter in the back. His body bounces across the ground, and Kitty turns back with a face full of rage. Deadpool says that it's time for them to wrap this all up. And Kitty charges through them, phasing in and out of all of the cyborgs. She tells them, a funny thing happens when you phase through machinery, seeing as you're all half machine. And Deadpool says, yeah, yeah, just do that thing and die. And then he hits her in the back with a stun gun. As he aims the gun at Kitty's head, he tells her, you're a spunk. But before the trigger is pulled, Nightcrawler teleports in, grabbing the gun. All of the remaining cyborgs turn to fire, and Deadpool shouts, Don't do it! But it's too late as everyone shoots, hitting Deadpool. Kitty and Nightcrawler begin taking out the rest of them, and Angel swoops down, grabbing Deadpool. And as they get high into the air, Angel releases him, letting him crash back into the ground. He starts to get back up, telling everyone, All right, no more fun! And Peter jumps in, punching him. He jumps on top of him, laying into him, and then he rips his mask off again, asking, What does it take for you to go night-night? Everyone stops fighting to look and they see the Deadpool's face as it is a skinless skull encased in plastic. And Deadpool shouts, God, I told you not to do that! And he kicks Peter off of him. He then opens fire, yelling, You don't have what it takes to win! They gave up everything to put you all down! Deadpool begins chasing down Peter specifically, and Kitty tells Colossus to throw her. Deadpool pins down Peter, asking if he understands it. Peter tells him, Yeah, this smell like a KFC dumpster in a hot deck! And as Deadpool pushes his gun into Peter's head, Kitty shoots through him, phasing through Deadpool's body. He falls back, screaming, and he begins to explode. But before he can go off, Kitty grabs Peter, facing the two of them away from the blast. The smoke starts to clear, and a group of cyborgs shouts, Let's get him for Wadey! But as the group okay. steps forward, a right. giant optic blast I'm back, got my cup of tea. Scott and Jean step out of the woods. As the two of them meet back up, Peter and the X-Men rip through 
through the island until they finally make their way to the studio. She telepathically asks Xavier, where is he? Let's take another look at this, shall we? Mojo tells the guards to just kill him. But when the guards don't move, he asks what's wrong, and then he turns back to see Xavier's collar. And then release. Yeah, type yeah, Oh my goodness, man. saying that they really should just leave this horrid place. The oldest hand out shaking Peter, telling him that he really came to their rescue. He fears what may have happened if he wasn't there. And he tells him that's great. So can he move in with them when his aunt kicks him out for being so late? A little while later, Peter and the X Men take one of the planes to leave the island, but watching them is the smoldering body of Deadpool. Much later in the night, Peter and Kitty walk over to Peter's house, and Peter says that it's 4 30 in the morning and there's no way out of this. He has to tell Aunt May that he's Spider Man. Kitty says that maybe they could get Professor or Jean to make her forget that he was missing in the first place. Peter tells her no, that would just be wrong. Peter and Kitty hold hands as Peter pushes the door open and finds an empty house. He checks Aunt May's room and sees that she isn't there. So Kitty faces back out, stating that the car isn't there either. She then looks at the phone to see that there's a message, and Peter hits play. Aunt May's voice says that she's sorry for not being home, but don't forget okay. she isn't there. So what do you guys think? It's going well. Staying out for them. Kitty laughs, saying that it looks like her aunt got her groove on. It looks like you really dodged the bullet. The class ends, and the students at home. Mary Jane stops Peter, telling him that she knows that he's been through a lot lately. He's going to have to come. That was stood away. I might do another spidey head here. I'm not sure. Even though he's currently dating Kitty Swan, Mary Jane says, speaking of, she hasn't noticed. Not sure. I might just, uh, you know, just do a face. Half and half. It's quite ambitious as I've already got this far, and it's taken me that long to get, or uh, well, this long to get this far on the sketch. So, as it wants his ink, it'll look a lot better. A web shoots out, grabbing her. Peter shouts, "Ta-da!" And the mother screams at Peter to get away from her baby. He sighs, telling her, "Yeah, you see that coming? Guess you go see what's going on there." He leaves over with a stand crashed, and he finds a man in a scorpion suit staring right back at him. The man in the suit shouts that he's not falling for any of his tricks. He's so much smarter than him that he's not even funny. He's the scorpion. And he's so much better than him. Peter tells him, "Well, if you are so much smarter, why don't you just lay down and take him while I beat the crap out of you, since you know what's gonna happen next." Scorpion shouts, I knew you were there. But before Peter can even ask what he's talking about, another voice calls out for them all to get on the ground. The two look back and see the police beginning to surround them, and Scorpion spins back, spraying the officers with his acid. As Peter jumps in to stop him, Scorpion backhands Peter, launching it into another stand. Peter quickly gets back up, and he webs Scorpion, and then he flings it into a pillar, and then he jumps on him, telling him, not so fast! I already get enough trouble from the cops! I don't need your help with that! The two start fighting back and forth, and Peter jumps on top, punching down onto Scorpion's head. But as the mask starts to break away, Peter stops when he sees Scorpion's face, and... Scorpion's face is his face. And meanwhile, back at the Watson house, Mary Jane rushes home to tell her mother that no matter what she's hurt, she's fine. She's still okay. Her mother hugs her, telling her that the city used to be so nice. But as Mary Jane heads back to her room, she smiles, thinking that maybe talking to Peter again was a good thing. So Mary Jane then lays down on her bed and begins to write her journal. And as she does, a hand reaches up, grabbing and covering her mouth. A few moments later, Mary Jane's mother comes to telling her that she got something in the mail and then notices the window open. Mary Jane, no word in sight. Later over in the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four begin to go about their day when there's a sudden alarm blaring, shouting, security breach. Sue and Reed look out the window to see Peter getting closer. And as Reed shouts to him not to get any closer to the building, flames shoot out burning him. A little while later, Peter wakes up inside of the Baxter building and Reed tells him that he cannot touch this building. They have the highest security known to me. Peter rubs his head telling him, well, I didn't have my cell phone, so either way, I need your help. Like, I really, really, really need your help. I need to know that I can trust you. I need to know who this Scorpion guy is. Reed says that they can run a blood test, and Peter says that they can do that and not tell anyone, right? Like, not tell Nick Fury. And Reed smiles, telling him, oh, that I can definitely do. Later in Reed's lab, he goes over the data that states that Scorpion is Peter, but only a 94.2% match. Peter asks, what's the 94.2 about? Reed tells him it's odd. Either it's a match or it's not. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Let's turn that a little bit up. Peter shouts, wait, pulling off his mask. I'm Peter Parker. And if I'm Peter Parker, then who's that in the tube? Over at S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, Nick Fury sits at his desk as he receives a call from Reed Richards. Nick says that he has not changed his mind about the squirrel initiative. And Reed says that he's not calling about that. He's calling to find out the government's take on human cloning. Nick says that, as they've seen on TV, is off the limits too morally indignant. And Reed then asks, right, so there is no cloning, right? And Nick tells him, nope, and I'm not doing it either if that's what you're asking. The call ends, Peter tells Reed he's lying. And Reed tells him, actually, for once, 
it, here is in line. The virtual sensor's reading body temperature and pulse rate fluctuations didn't even budge. So he's actually telling the truth. Peter asks, who would do this? I'm kind of freaking out here right now. The Reed says that they need to run some more tests, but they will need a blood sample from the real Peter Parker. As Reed starts to draw blood, he asks Peter how he got his powers. And Peter says, well, he was bitten by a spider. Reed tells him that's cute, but really how? And Peter says again, I was bitten by a spider. It was a big spider. Later, Peter heads back home, and as he opens the door to his house, Aunt May runs out asking if Mary Jane's with him. Peter says, no, what's going on? Aunt May shouts that Mary Jane is missing. Peter I'm not happy with this one at all, guys. As it begins to get dark outside, not happy with the one on the side. <coughs> but this is the main focal point. This is just a sketch I did on the side. He hops out of the window, asking if Mary Jane is there, and then a voice tells him, Sorry, Tiger, this is going to be awkward. Peter looks back and sees a woman in a Spider Man suit hanging from the wall. After a moment of silence, Peter asks, Who are you? Where is Mary Jane? The woman says that she doesn't know. She doesn't get to be a part of that part of the story. Peter jumps over at the woman, who effortlessly dodges, and jumps in, tossing Peter into a wooden post. The woman says, look, I'm not going to fight you. That isn't going to happen. Plus, you're kind of off your game right now anyway. So for Mary Jane, I don't know. A pipe is thrown at a delivery <laughs> to avoid the hit. She shouts, fine! And she shoots a web out of her finger. They're on Instagram. Webbing she shoots watch over, it. throwing Peter back against the wall, causing it to fall on top of him. And the woman says that she shouldn't have come here. It's all her fault. As she turns the leaf, she tells Peter that she'll get them back for him. She'll do it for all of them. A short while later, Peter wakes back up asking what happened. And he scrambles to get back to the warehouse and roof He calls out for Mary Jane, hoping to get some kind of response. And then he looks at the old house and sees someone standing there. The girl walks into the house and Peter chases after her. And he sees Gwen. Gwen Stacy, who died with a car accident. Ah, that's crap. All right, let's get back to the hand on this one. Task at hand, haha. -ha. Elsewhere, though, Mary Jane wakes up in a giant tube asking, Where is she? She begins to feed on the glass, asking if anyone's there. And then Peter's voice tells her to just calm down. Peter's shadow then says, It's going to be okay. I know how to protect you now. Mary Jane screams to let her out. And as she does, no one else is out of the old Osborne facility can hear her. Peter goes on saying that this is where it all happened, remember? This is where Spider-Man was born. He realizes now that he broke up with her because he was so worried that something would happen to her. And he thought about a wonderful idea. Why not make them equals? That way they could be peers and she could defend herself. He steps out from the shadows and half of his face melted away, telling her that he's going to make her just like him. Back in Peter's old house, the two sit down and Gwen says that she remembers waking up in a hospital. But she doesn't remember where. Images start to flash in Gwen's head. Images of doctors dying and police shooting at her. She then stares at Peter and says that she doesn't remember. Peter tells her that she was dead. And now she can't remember how she got here. And Gwen stops and asks if she was dead. She then looks back down saying that she doesn't know how she was supposed to react. She grabs and hugs Peter and then the light shines down on them. And Aunt May asks what is... She sees Gwen and then suddenly realizes that she's looking at Gwen. And she runs back home. Gwen says that she really was dead then. Peter tells her, yeah, you were. Shortly after that, Peter and Gwen run after Aunt May as she tries to call the police, and Peter begs for her to put the phone down. After a brief moment of shock, Aunt May sits, and Peter tells her, look, there's no easy way to say this, but I need to tell you, I'm Spider-Man. I always have been, and Gwen was killed, or so we thought, by a monster who was looking for me. Aunt May takes a moment to process this, and then she folds her arms, telling Peter to prove it. Prove that he's Spider-Man. Peter jumps to the ceiling, telling her, see? Aunt May tells him to stop. She then says, so everything was normal. All of that trouble and Harry, and now this? Even though I saw Gwen's dead body with my own eyes, Peter tells her that he doesn't know how, but clearly there's a scientific explanation. He just doesn't know what it is. Aunt May tells him to stop. She understands. Now, just get out. Take whatever that is and get out. Peter tries to tell her to wait, but Aunt May shouts that he is not her son. She gave up her adult life for him, and all he has done is lie to her. Take those ghosts and get out of the house. A voice from down below then asks Aunt May, when did she get so feisty? Everyone turns back to see Richard Parker. He says that she should take it easy. He was only a kid trying to make the most out of an impossible situation. Aunt May scoffs, stating, wonderful timing. Now you can take your son and get out. Peter asks, is that really you? Dad, are you alive? And then he looks at Aunt May, and she still doesn't respond. Meanwhile, over at the Baxter building, Nick Fury looks at Scorpion and asks, so this is Peter Parker. Reed tells him no. After some tests, his best guess is that someone cloned him and then tampered with the cloning in an attempt to enhance him. And then asks if someone was doing super soldier experiments with cloning. Nick doesn't say anything. He radios back to S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters to get the Spider Slayers ready. He's going to need the full battalion and a cleaning crew. Things are about to get messy. Back at Peter's house, his father hugs him. And Aunt May shouts that she's glad they're back together, but now they can all get out. She's had enough of the Parker drama for the rest of her life. Peter shouts, wait. 
she knew that his dad was alive and she didn't tell him on May snaps back that he's Spider-Man and didn't tell her. She was just trying to protect him from all of this, this exact thing. And without paying much attention to Peter and Aunt May, Richard turns to Gwen and asks how she's feeling. She must be hungry. As Richard opens the fridge, Aunt May asks, what is he doing? She wants them all to leave. Richard pulls out a pizza and says, look, all pizza is perfect for this kind of a thing. Back at the Osborne facility, Mary Jane sits in her tube, now strapped to a chair, and Peter tells her that this place used to be state-of-the-art, but don't worry. Soon, she's going to be just like him. She'll be able to protect herself. As Peter starts setting up the machine, he's suddenly kicked in the face. And then a six-armed spider... You're listening to Comic Story and reading out comics to you guys. His, house, his father explains the events of what happened the day the plane crashed that supposedly took his life. Just before... Well, I draw, obviously. ...on further work on the suit. Since the company that they were working for wanted the weapon his mother and Mary decided that it would be their best chance to finally get back out of the financial slump that they were in, but ultimately he refused to go along with it. Peter listens and then asks, what about Gwen? Why is Gwen alive? Why are you here? And Richard says, yes, you really were a smart boy. Back at Oscorp, the six-armed Spider-Man fights the cloned Peter back, stating that he knew that he would try something like this. He's not going to let him touch Mary Jane. He then kicks the clone back, telling him that this isn't why they were created. The cloned Peter grabs a steel beam and throws it, shouting, SHUT UP! And then he tackles the six-armed Spider-Man to the ground. He starts to beat on him, punching him over and over, and after the six-armed Spider-Man stops moving, the cloned Peter Parker looks back at Mary Jane, stating, It's okay, sweetie. It's all going to be okay now. Meanwhile, over at Peter's house, mm, his okay. father continues the story, stating that he's not going to like this part, but metaphorically, he was dead, or at least in every legal sense. It was then that a man named Henry Burich from the CIA found him. Henry knew that he was supposed to be dead, but he had a unique offer for him to allow him to continue his work. Henry said that there was a man by the name of Nick Fury who had weaseled his way through the world government ladder and was now working on a super soldier serum. He wanted to make a team of super soldiers like Captain America in order to police the world, and frankly, the CIA didn't trust him. A little while later, Henry brought in footage of the Venom suit when it broke loose, and in that video, his father saw his son, Peter. Henry told him that Peter had become Spider-Man, and Nick Fury had already gotten to him. It was one day when May was leaving work that he approached her, but she refused to let him anywhere near Peter. But also, Henry wouldn't let him talk to his son, regardless of his fear of what was going on with Nick Fury, because he was scared that it would compromise the whole operation. Peter stands up from his table shouting that none of this explains why Gwen is still here. His father goes on stating that he was never supposed to know that she existed. All of the advancement in stem cell research combined with Connor's advance, before we can go any further, a light shines in the house and a voice calls out that they are surrounded. Outside, Nick Fury shouts over a microphone that there are several dozen robots, and he says that they are here to take them all into custody. As they can see, I'm going to get with that. I can't get any bad that. It's too small, but normally do it a lot bigger. It's like uh, normally have it sort of that way, straight up. More, more, more lines I put onto this, guys. The more it looks bad. So I'm just trying to get it close enough. I think. Congratulations. This is the all new her. Outside of Peter's house, Gwen Stacy, now looking like the Carnage Monster, jumps straight into a group of robots and rips through, tearing everything apart. Nick shouts within a fire, and the robots begin to shoot beams, hitting the house. And inside, Peter grabs Aunt May and Richard Parker, Peter Parker's father, who joined us. If you really don't know what's going on, you really should check out the last episode. Tells his son that he will take care of Aunt May. Peter needs to get out there and stop whatever is going on. Peter hesitates for a moment, and then Richard tells him, you need to listen to your father. Peter turns, jumping out of the house, bolting off of the robot, shouting for Nick Fury. Peter makes his way over to him, grabs his gun, telling him that he needs to stop. His aunt is in the house, and Nick shouts for him to get off! You're under arrest! But before anything else can happen, Peter is hit by one of the robot's beams, and then Nick points his gun at Peter, telling him, I understand, but you need to stay down. Peter lunges back up, grabbing at Nick's throat, but then another robot fires, hitting him. And Nick tells him, I'm really sorry, but you need to stay down. The next hit will paralyze you for good. He holds up his gun and then is blasted with fire, and a voice tells him, Dude, leave that guy alone. Everyone looks up to see the Fantastic Four and Reed Richards asking what exactly is going on here. Nick tells Reed to take his team and go home. And Reed stops him, asking, why are you doing this? Peter's done nothing wrong. Nick shouts that this is a military operation and he's giving them a direct order to go home. Ben Grimm looks at Gwen and he says, no offense, but she is one of ugly. But before Ben can finish his sentence, Gwen grabs him and flings him across the street into a building. Reed shouts to Nick that they just can't take over a neighborhood because they found a clone. 
Peter interrupts them, screaming that his aunt is still inside. She had a stroke or something, and my dad is in there too. Sue Storm pushes the group, telling Nick that there's an older woman inside that needs their help. What is the matter with him? And while Sue creates a force field, he goes inside of the house, Reed stretches around, slowly pulling Gwen down, stating, this is just fascinating. Inside, Sue checks on Aunt May, and she asks Richard what he has done to help. Richard stumbles over his words, telling her nothing, nothing. So Sue says, you're a doctor, but either way, we're going to need to get her out of here. Once Sue brings May outside, she tells Peter that she's... I'm getting, getting annoyed, I'm getting, getting annoyed. Can't, can't get this right, I can't get this right, oh, why can't I get this right? Like and he charges through the robots, calling out to Nick Fury. Nick tells his men to do it, full power. And suddenly there's a bright blue light that blasts through, covering the entire area. And then in a flash, it's over. Everyone stares at Gwen, now back in her human form, and she collapses. Peter falls to his knees, and Nick walks over to him, pointing his gun, telling him, I wasn't lying before. You don't get to be Spider-Man anymore. And Peter looks at him, tell me what you did. And Nick sighs, telling him that he didn't do anything. It was his clothes. He's truly sorry about this. Back at the Oscorp facility, Mary Jane asks, what did you do? The clone Peter says that she knows what Oz was, right? He injected her with it. The stuff that made Otto Octavius into Dr. Octopus, Norman Osborn into Green Goblin, and with it, he recreated her. Mary Jane shouts that he put something inside of her, and as she steps forward, she falls over in pain. Cloned Peter asks if she's okay, and then a giant red arm shoots her, and a hulking red beast stands up and screams! Back in the house, Nick Fury puts cuffs on Peter Parker and Reed Richards says that he can't do this. Peter just looks at him and tells him, just let it go. It's all over now. Suddenly, the spider woman from before jumps in, kicking Nick Fury away, and she grabs Peter Parker and leaves off. Johnny Storm tries to follow, but as they get into the city, he loses sight of them. Down in the alleyway, the woman puts her fingers to her lips until Johnny flies off. Once the ghost is clear, she breaks the cuffs, holding Peter back, and tells Peter to follow. Her. The two jump onto the Jersey Turnpike, and when they land onto a passing truck, Peter asks, Peter looks at them, stating, Spider Woman? Peter asks again, so the woman pulls her mask down to show that she looks like her. Peter asks if she's him, and the woman tells him, kind of, sort of, I'm a clone. Right now, we're heading over to find the other clones, and I'll tell you everything that I know. It all started about a month ago when I was four. There was a man named Ben Riley who was saying how there had been so many other clones, except in her case, they decided they wanted to try making a female. They said that she would be working as a special agent for the CIA, and that her name was going to be... Schadenfreude, I can't get this thing done. The sample that he took when things went wrong. And just before she passed back out, she remembers hearing Ben say something about making her like the next Captain America, except that there would be an army of 200 Spider-Men. As Jessica sits back, she asks Peter if he's okay. Peter calmly tells her no. In fact, he should be like in a coma. Jessica goes on to explain that one day during testing, one of the other clones broke out of the cell and began to tear the place down. It was after it escaped that all of the doors to the other cells opened and everyone broke free. Peter asks if one of those clones took Mary Jane. Any comments? Welcome, guys, if you want to have a chat. She's hoping that she's wrong. But right now, this is their stop. They jump off of the truck. Peter follows behind, and then he sees that they're now at the old Osborne facility. They see what Mary Jane has now become, and she's fighting the Peter clone. Jessica webs up the six-armed Spider-Man, pulling him to safety, and then she takes off his mask, telling him to rise and shine. And as the six-armed Spider-Man looks at the real Peter, Peter tells him, we're going to do our Oh My Gods later. The six-armed Peter then looks back at Mary Jane and says, that idiot did it. He injected her with Oz. Mary Jane continues to thrash about, and just before slamming a piece of metal, Onto the clone Peter Parker. Peter runs up telling Mary Jane to stop. This is the real him. She screams as she starts to revert. And the cloned evil Peter says, look, she can protect herself now. Peter punches the clone shouting that there's no Oz here. This place was empty. So where did you get it from? And the voice says, from our father. Peter looks back and sees Otto Octavius walking in along with Nick and Reed. Over at the hospital, Sue and Richard follow the doctors as they rush up May to the ER. And as she's taken away, Richard asks if she's going to be okay. Sue notices that it's a bit strange that Richard, being a doctor, doesn't know what the outcome would be. And she says that she would like to take Richard's blood to check on a few things. Back at the Osborne facility, Peter stares at Otto Octavius, thinking that he's going to kill him. He can do this. He can kill him, and he won't go to jail. He's a kid. But as Peter tries to step forward, Jessica holds him back. Otto tells Peter that it's good to see him again. The clones are right there, so if you'd be so kind as to wrap them all up for me. Reed looks at the clones and says that he made three clones, and one of those was a female? With one of the clones, they denied a clone its Y chromosome in phase two. As you can see, she was a success. Jessica looks at Otto, asking if he was the one who created her. He smiles. Yes, it was me. 
She grits her teeth, telling him that she's going to kill him. But before she can move, Nick pulls out his gun, telling her, don't. There's been enough of that tonight. Johnny lands by Peter, asking what the heck is going on. And Peter picks up Mary Jane, shouting that they need to help her. She's been infected with eyes. Johnny shouts that they can fix that, right? And Nick tells him no. He needs the Fantastic Four to pack up and leave. As Johnny and Nick argue, Peter Parker pushes them aside, stating, please help Mary Jane. Ben takes her and Reed says that he can do everything that he can. And the clone Peter shouts, no. She's okay! I fixed her! The clone Peter then jumps up, and the soldiers open fire on him. Jessica begins to punch the soldiers, and Nick fires his gun, shouting that he's had enough of this. Otto Octavius tells Nick that he appreciates the good work here. But this is currently their problem. So they'll be taking their subjects back. <sighs> Nick says that he ain't taking crap. There's a lot that he's going to be answering for. And above all of that, he's under arrest for this little house of horrors that he created. Peter pushes through asking, Hey guys, what do you think? How are you not dead or in jail? And Otto laughs, stating that he made a deal with the federal government to help design a super soldier. It would seem that there are many people in the United States government that should be the comments. Peter, and they didn't want him to be the only person with what they would call a Captain America But so now, thanks to the good people over at the FBI, he can continue his work as Dr. Octavius before everything went wrong. Otto then goes on stating that I have your blood sample from your friend Kurt Connor's assistant, which allowed me to continue my work. And Jessica there has proof that it's working. He then leaves the Hey guys, still in a sketch stage. I'm finished, I think, with the uh, main image there. I'm going to ink that one soon. I'm um, just sort of working on the side one here and uh, doing another one here, just as a like a mask. I might do a half and half, sort of. You know, with a half with his eye and, you know, normal face. And then the <coughs> other half, it's quite a mask, but I don't know about that. I'm starting to get frustrated now, so I might just go into the ink. Otto asks, what are you doing? And Nick tells him, he's right, I'm not in charge here. So... Go on, be in charge. As Nick shuts the door to leave, the six-armed Spider-Man pushes everyone aside and jumps on Otto, stating, Hi, Daddy! As he slams Otto down, the real Peter jumps in and just as quickly is knocked away. The metal in the room begins to twist, and Otto shouts that he tried so hard to keep this part of his life secret. And that's when the metal pipe shoots in the air, impaling the six-armed Spider-Man, and Otto continues stating that it was the arms that made me. It was metal, and I can control metal. Outside, Nick Fury pulls out his gun, shouting for everyone to halt, and Henry walks up stating, that's nice. I'm with the FBI, so no offense to you, but you should just stand down. Henry then asks, where is Otto? And Nick asks, who? The guy with the bowl cut and the show that should be in jail at this very moment. Henry shouts for him to stop that, and Nick goes on stating that he wouldn't have made a deal with Otto to make Super Soldier blow an experiment behind his back. And now it blew up in your face, and you're going to get fired. Aren't you? Back inside, Otto creates more mechanical arms out of the scrap metal, shouting that he will not mess around with them. Jessica needs to surrender or I will kill her and clone another. Peter jumps at Otto and Otto knocks him away, asking, who's next? One of the arms shoots back, hitting Jessica, and as she picks herself back up, she tries webbing up Otto Octavius. As the webbing hits the arms, Otto laughs, and then he launches one, slamming Jessica into the computers. Otto then turns back to Peter, shouting, you need to embrace your defeat. But this time, as the arm is thrown, Peter punches through it, shattering Otto then asks, what? No witty comment? That's how I know you're scared. Jessica shouts, no, that's not it. It's just how we know when he's being serious. And she swings and kicking Otto to the ground. As Otto Octavius gets back up, all of the metal on the ground begins to swirl around, sucking everything up. And Otto shouts, why is it that you always have to involve yourself in my life's work? Just die already! As the metal flies around, Peter and Jessica jump along the arms, and together they punch Otto Octavius right in the head. The metal in the room starts to fall, and Peter huffs, stating, and that felt good. And Jessica says, yeah, but it's kind of lame that it took both of us to do it. Jessica checks on the other two clones and says that they're both dead. Peter says this is all so weird. They need to go. She jumps up stating that he can't be serious and surrender. Peter tells her that he has to. If he runs, they're going to chase him. And right now, Mary Jane and Aunt May's health is more important. Jessica leaps away, telling him that she isn't going to stick around here and argue with herself. Outside, Nick and Henry continue to bicker as Peter shuffles out, holding Otto's body. Nick asks, where's the girl? Peter says that she, um, left? There are two more clones inside, though, both dead. And Henry says that that's good. Peter looks at Henry and shouts, good? Tell me, because I would really like to know if there's any part of you that understands how insanely evil you really are. Henry turns back to Peter, and before he can yell, Johnny flies down telling Peter that he has to come with him. He grabs a hold of Peter's arms, and he flies him over to the Baxter building. And inside of the lab, Dr. Franklin Storm looks over Mary Jane, and Reed tells Peter that they isolated the Oz compound. But Mary Jane begins to talk hey, to Peter, and, and then her eyes open, and she sees Peter. I'm uh, just doing a little fat round here. 
that one was absolutely crap but this is the main focal for today okay right so i'm going to Oh End it here, guys. Or should I yeah, continue on with the inking while I'm live? Right? Let's carry on with this. Let's try and get this right. Let's try and get this right. But they would still very much like to watch over Mary Jane for a little bit. And be it as it may, it may take some time, but they can't cure him as well. Wouldn't have to be Spider Man anymore if he didn't want to. Now to catch you up on what we skipped over, Peter Parker is back with Mary Jane. And Kitty Pride was kicked out of the X-Men and now goes to the school that Peter Parker and Mary Jane are at. Nick Fury is also gone and Carol Danvers is now the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. Also, Harry became a goblin himself. Now aboard the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, acting director Carol Danvers walks down to a cell asking, What exactly does he want? And the soldier with her tells her that he wants to talk to Nick Fury. Carol says that Nick isn't here. Can't one of them just put on an eye patch or something and pretend that they are Nick? And the soldier tells her that he's pretty sure that they'll see through that. And Carol says, fine, open it up. Inside the holding cell, Norman Osborne asks, who are you? And Carol says that she... <coughs> Once I think that I'll get rid of all the um, like sketchy lines. It's, this is my main piece. It's, this one here is just me faffing around. And this one here is uh, me faffing around again. Theory offered me a deal with some privileges in return for my scientific cooperation. Carol asks exactly what are these privileges that you speak of. And Norman says, I want to see my son. I'm willing to play ball and make a deal. So Carol tells him, yeah, you're going to have to pass on that one. Norman scoffs, telling her, just get me fury. And Carol tells him that he may have missed the part of the conversation where I said that he wasn't here. And Norman shouts, I'm ready to make my deal. This is a complete waste of time just sitting here. And Carol tells him, well, you should have thought of that before you turned yourself into a goblin and started killing people. As Carol turns to leave, Norman shouts at her again, and Carol looks at him and taunts him, saying, Woo! and slams the door shut. Back in the control room, she begins to go over the current captured villains, each one checked off, except for Harry Oswald. A S.H.I.E.L.D. agent says that they keep him elsewhere. She sits back, stating that all of this is insane. They're keeping all of these maniacs in their basement. It's like they're sitting on a nuclear bomb. One of the operators then says that they have a problem. Osborne's cell went dark. She asks, like what, someone turned off the lights dark? And the operator says, no, like all monitor feeds, his vitals, everything. And she says that maybe it's just a, but before she can even finish her sentence, an explosion goes off in that basement. Moments before the explosion, Norman was sitting in his cell brooding, thinking about how the only difference between him and Nick Fury is that he knows that he's a monster, and Nick does it. It's fine, though. They can take away his money, throw him in jail, throw him whatever. They can do whatever they want because he wants them to know that everything they have done to him isn't enough to keep him caged. And now it's his turn to destroy him. As Norman sits, his body begins to smoke and soon it catches fire. The fire spreads and then there's an explosion going off, blowing a massive hole into the side of the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters. Norman steps out of his destroyed cell and the blast caused most of the other cells to open and free the criminals, including Gwen Stacy's clone. As Norman gets ready to leave, he hears Otto Octavius telling him, You're looking rather well. Otto takes one of his metal arms, slamming it into Norman, telling him, Just so you know, I'm the one who gave you up to the fence. I sold you out the first chance that I got. I even gave them the formula, and they still couldn't figure it out. Norman reaches up, crushing one of the metal arms, and Otto asks, Why is that? What was it that they created? With only thinking to himself that Otto is in his way, Norman throws a fireball and jumps at him. Otto then asks, why are you still attacking? Can't you take a moment to marvel at all of what has happened? As Otto knocks Norman back, he tells him, never mind, you can't just keep being you. However, as Otto goes back to taunting Norman, he's suddenly electrocuted and falls to the ground. Electro asks Norman if he can hear him. Also, you're welcome for the save. However, I'm auditioning for some work. I'm going to need something that may ease while I'm on the outside. Norman tells him to find him in a few days. There will be some work. Electro rockets off into the sky, telling him, Awesome. I'll see you then. Also, that time that we almost took over the White House? Good times. As Norman leaps out of the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, attack helicopters moving to try and take him down. And they managed to shoot Norman back into the water. The pilots report that they have confirmed hits, but once the helicopters get overhead, Norman jumps back out of the water, throwing more fireballs at them. The S.H.I.E.L.D. take most of the blast, but Norman jumps over to a helicopter, ripping out one of the men. Then after taking over the controls, he crashes the helicopter into another and rips through the last of them. As he lands, he says that he's going to crucify Fury. I'm going to crucify him on national television for this. 
little while later at Norman's lawyer Joseph's apartment, he gets ready to go out and he sees Norman standing in the mirror fixing his tie. Joseph asks, what is he going on about? And Norman tells him that he needs money so that he can put it away for a rainy day. Also contact a publicist. I'm going to need a booking ASAP. Later, as the news reports on the escape from the show headquarters are televised, the report mentions that they have an exclusive interview with their reporter, Patsy Walker. The camera changes and Patsy says that as of late, the fate of Norman Osborne is... Okay, I'm going to leave these. I'm not going to bother anymore with these. Um, these were just literally sketches on the side that I just wanted to do, take my mind off this while I was doing it. Um, but if you like these guys, they're just little doodles. Hopefully you do like this one here, as uh, that is... The main piece that I'm doing. So, yeah, guys, hopefully you will enjoy the uh, pen session in a moment. <clears throat> I'm going to take a quick, again, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to go off live for a minute or two and uh, get myself ready for inking this piece. And then later on tonight, I will take it over to um, Creto to finish painting and putting some color to it. Otherwise, guys, thank you very much for watching this two-hour stream, and I will be back very shortly today, as it is an all-day event. And I'll see you very shortly. Thank you very much for watching, guys. See you in a moment. His name is Dr. Miles Ward, a friend of his aunt's. Dude says, uh, hi, can I talk to my aunt 